see the feedback that was coming from one and all. So, well done. Whakataka te hau ki te uru. Whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina ki uta. Kia mā tara tara ki tai. E hi a ke ana te atakura. He teo, he huke, he hau nu, tihei mauri. Kia ora, tia. Thank you. Apologies. I have um, an apology temporarily for Juraf Van Baek, who's gone feeling not well, is going to join online. Is there any other apologies? Someone move the apology, yes. Will, Craig, all those in favour say aye. 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 I don't know. Carried. Notices. There are none. Conflicts of interest declarations. Anybody got any conflicts of interest they'd like to declare? There's been none. Minutes of the Regional Council held on the 25th of May been circulated. There's no comments or alterations <coughs> suggested. Is there, Leanne? No. Would someone like to move? Uh, minutes? Jacqueline, would you like to second it? Will? All those in favour say aye. Aye. Godfrey, no. Carried. Follow ups from the previous Regional Council meeting. I'll hand over to the Chief Executive now for that. Chair, my um, device has just crashed and I'm now restarting it, so. I am without the papers momentarily. Um, but we could take those as read and take any questions. Any questions? <coughs> you want some? All right. Uh, would someone move that the uh, uh, Assuming Organisational Activities Report be accepted? Uh, Neil? For looking to follow ups. But we're dealing with the follow ups. <coughs> Oh, follow-ups. Yep, sorry. <laughs> sorry. To uh, receive the follow-ups report, be received. Second, uh, moved Martin. Uh, seconded Neil. All those papers say aye. 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 Item five, significant organisational activities looking forward through July 2020. Chair, to just, just as I try to restart uh, Stella, I... Um, just draw Council's attention to the fact that the uh, item in relation to the request of tourism infrastructure fund funding for uh, a toilet block at Waitangi Regional Park uh, was approved last week and I think announced by the Minister of Tourism last Friday, so <clears throat> very pleased to be a recipient of $400,000 worth of funding that will be matched with um, budgeted Council funding for the development of uh, that facility, uh, which also includes a, a permanent power uh, electricity connection to the uh, marquee site, which uh, was graced last week, obviously, uh, for Matariki uh, celebrations uh, during the week. That will enable us to run uh, public events more generally at that site uh, over time. So uh, that was a very pleasing uh, development. And can I just also uh, convey apologies to uh, councillors that there is um, repetition in paragraphs 40, 41 and 42, and in paragraphs 52, 53 and 54, um, we seem to have a recurring issue with um, uh, text being tra transposed twice into these reports, which we will seek to remedy and avoid happening in the future. Uh, but, uh, and also in paragraph 36 is reference to the session and sessional conditions that is of course seasonal. Um, other than that, really happy to take any questions, Chair. Okay, <clears throat> I'll put those in the performance review. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Questions, let's move from left to right. Uh, I'll start uh, with Mike down the end of the table. No, no questions from me at the moment, Mr Chairman, thank uh, you. Uh, thank you. Michelle? Um, yes, Mr. Chair. Um, just want to know uh, the number two, the Tūru the Ako One Billion Two Program. Um, <coughs> where are those uh, 102 hectares and native trees being planted? That's my first. Chair, as this relates to 61 groups, the answer to that will be lengthy. So, can I suggest as a follow-up item that we'll provide um, the detail of those um, to the next meeting? Thank you, Craig. Thanks. It was kind of a combination of a follow-up and this. Previously, I've asked about um, the, the, any changes in the amount of water quality monitoring sites, particularly around the, the Karamu. And then on 60, uh, item 60, um, the, the region-wide thing, oh, Paris 60, you took, uh, there's a point there about the eDNA samples. So I wonder if you just tell us a little bit more about that and also 64, 
which is that um, these these tools for, for those who are interested to understand and monitor quality is it that more wholesale or is that retail? Um, where's that going, please? This is Chair, I'll defer to Mr. Maxwell on that. Mr. Maxwell. <coughs> Through you, Chair. Um, in relation to eDNA, uh, we've uh, collected eDNA is, is a process by which we can take a, a water sample, we can run it through DNA, DNA sequencing, and it'll tell us all of the species that have had contact with that water upstream of that point. So we've uh, recently um, invested in running eDNA across those 100 sample sites that we've taken across the region. The technology's obviously advanced to the point where it's affordable and is picking up um, uh, a wider range of species. So the, the information's away um, being processed at the moment. It'll be brought back and then reported. And that'll, it'll give us simply a snapshot of what species both freshwater and terrestrial had contact with um, that water body upstream of that point. So that, that's a, a very high level quick summary of that. I can provide more detail once the report is produced, if you would that, like that to would be great. When that arrives, will we see the, kind of the location? Um, I'm particularly interested in the heri heri and the, the, those that contribute to the larger Karamu stream. Yep, so certainly can make the information available and you can find out what's where. Uh, in relation to the Excel tool, uh, look, this is an in-house developed thing, so it's not an off-the-shelf product. It's really a tool that allows or uh, well, supports what we call citizen science. So we're aware that there are many groups, individuals doing their own sampling work across the motu. Uh, we are providing a tool for them to store, collect, analyse and interpret the data. Um, it's their data. Um, uh, we, we do, where possible, try to acquire it ourselves, but really the point of the tool is to help people help themselves at this point. Uh, is there a place... Thanks, Chair, one more. Is there a place where they'll all come together? Because you've got land and water, um, Aotearoa, and it's in you know, a more formal scientific type sites. You've got this, the DNA sampling you mentioned, and you've got on 64, which is obviously looks a little bit more informal. But is there a place where you can see all of those and make your own judgments? So Lawa is a television portal for information that we hold ourselves. So Lawa is just a television screen that reflects all council's data at the moment, both water quality, quality and quantity and other things. But I guess the point with the citizen science or community collected information is it's their information. Um, we don't have a, we, we, we don't we can't demand it. Um, if they provide it, we do collect it and store it. It sits in our our data systems and is quality coded as being citizen science data because obviously we can't be sure that it's being collected in accordance with our processes and practices. But but there's no one portal, if you like, across New Zealand for collecting all this information at this point. It's certainly something that has been discussed and thought about in places like the Our Land and Science uh, National, uh, National Science Challenge um, and those things have been considered. The tension being that groups often are reluctant to provide their information into a, a place where it's available and accessible to others. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. This is probably for you as well, Ian. Um, uh, just around the Karamu also, number 30. Karamu Catchment Collective and Sub Catchments Action Planning Series coming up from today. So just a little bit of information on that. Sure. And, and look, just... Just for absolute clarity, there is a, a linkage in this work with the Karamu Catchment Coordinator and Chris's team. Um, this this collective is focused very much on the rural landscapes, and whereas Chris's coordinator is working more in the urban space. Two, two, um, two. Great, thank you. And just one more question as well, but going down to Councillor Foss's section as well, uh, 57 <coughs> continued efforts to contact customers requiring telemetry. Um, one, a little bit more on that, telemetry, what it actually is, installation, but I, but more actually is interest is around those continued efforts. What does that mean? Continued, is it, has it been a 
Yeah, Is she? So, so as the paper indicates, um, by um, September this year, we'll consent uh, less than 20 litres second lady care telemetry installed. Uh, so it's just a matter of contact. But you're, you're talking about contacting busy orchards or crop trusts and, and making time to connect with them, probably do a site visit and advise them on installs, providers, those sorts of things. But there's no indications that that takes Okay, that's great. Thank you. That's all, thanks. Council Curtin. I don't have a <coughs> Any wire. Kia ora, Chia. Um, kia ora, koutou. Um, I'm on um, number 29, so the outcomes of Ruruaki Turi and Ahurere Integrated Farm Planning Accelerator. Fun applications. I don't believe we've sort of come across that. Could you, Ian, just um, outline the organisations that are actually applying for the applications and what the outcomes are for that type of fund? Yeah, sure. And look, apologies that this section is um, brief to the point of being um, unhelpful. It doesn't actually explain what's happening. What's, what's going on across 26 to 29 is that we are supporting collectively working in those areas on obtaining obtaining funding themselves. Um, yep. You have the unenviable um, record, Ian, of being the only council staff member who's worn the microphone. Yes, well, I'm, I'm happy not to have all the questions, but thank you, Chair. Um, <laughs> yes, and my colleagues tell me that I talk too much as well. That's why I'm getting snuggled out to the side. Um, so back to the uh, uh, formalities here. Yes, that, so what's happening is that we are supporting these groups to obtain funding themselves. So the, um, there's an accelerator fund that MPI have established to provide support for um, people to do things like farm plans uh, for them to employ and engage their own supporters and coordinators. So we're just helping them effectively write the bids and guide them through the process. Okay, thank you for that. And just the last thing to mention, um, just around the Waitangi Regional Park and how successful it's been during the Matariki time, thousands of people, Māori, non-Māori, celebrating Matariki there, so it's a real asset to us as a council. Kia ora. Kia ora. I'd endorse that, 100%. Right, thank Charles. You. <coughs> uh, kia ora. Yep, yep. Just some quick one on number 28, the um, MPI funding scoping. I take it as that to do with the, um, the flood, floods and oh, the, your result from the survey. Uh, kia ora, Council. No, so, so again, this is just helping uh, the Wairau Catchment Collective um, obtain funding. Um, so it's working through a process to scope the funding that they think they need and then helping them to connect to funding sources for it. Cool, and I look at that, the other one on um, reference to cameras for the, the wild river flooding system. So that sounds really positive. We've got some more to come. Yes, yeah, so we, we've tried to roll out um, web cameras to um, as many of our flood ne networks as we can. Um, it's obviously helpful not only to see the telemetry information but also to to visualise what's happening with the river and its conditions at the time. So the te that technology has become very cheap and um, the cost of getting the data to us is negligible, so we're trying to put in as many as we can. As long as it uh, likes the water. Thank you. <coughs> Up the other. Um, I've got no questions, but I do have a comment, if I may. Comment away. Um, just want to acknowledge, actually, rather than a comment, <coughs> um, I know that the Kotahi and the Māori Standing Committee and the Regional Planning Committee are on the agenda today, so I'll just be brief in acknowledging the opportunity um, that was foregone on the 22nd. Um, to the Chief Executive and to the staff who turned up on the day, I just want to acknowledge their presence. It symbolised a genuine amount of enthusiasm at a staff level to get behind the Kotahi plan. So while I understand there are still some progressive steps for us to make in that space. I just wanted to acknowledge the staff that were there on the day and uh, the sad loss that they didn't get the chance to share all their expertise with us. So, kia ora. Thank you, that would be much appreciated. Councillor no, Williams. No, thank you. Hmm. Will follow you. Kia ora, Chair. Um, just in the traffic light um, section there, number nine, farm um, environment management plans, just well done to all those involved that um, got us to yeah. to where we got to by the extended deadline. Um, 
Firstly, seven properties didn't resubmit. Um, I can't think of really any excuse why there'd still be some outstanding the second time and 12 months extended from the deadline, so no doubt the appropriate action has been taken there. Um, just skip to the end there. Now looking forward to 2024, um, so that's only two years away and possibly 12 months. People should be starting to think about um, their um, three-year rollover of, of looking to redo their plan again. So uh, is there any learnings this time from um, what we might do differently to approach this and, and, and hopefully um, kind of get um, all those things in by the by the deadline next time. Through you, Chair, we're about to send out a survey to all FEM holders and ask them those very questions. I think one of the things that we, we would note that has been re <coughs> reported through is that the, uh, the the timetable means that there are bow ways of activity in terms of uh, FEM planning and therefore FEM <coughs> provider uh, burden. And if we can get to a, uh, a place of region-wide, ultimately, uh, given that uh, the regulations relating to farm environment planning are expected to be rolled out shortly, uh, which will in time see comprehensive uh, coverage of farm environment planning right across the region. <coughs> It'll be important that that is done in a way that it sustains a, a, a sustainable workforce, if you like, in terms of the provision of the technical advice and skills, and also enables council to receive and process uh, farm environment plans um, <coughs> on a uh, on, I guess on a sustained basis that doesn't create peaks and troughs for resourcing for everybody involved. So, yeah, I think that's one of the things we learned out of Tuki Tuki. It's first time around for those rules and, and it is coming in fits and starts. I have one question and it relates to the tank plan. <clears throat> and I just, it's a, a question for the record. When was it expected the tank uh, uh, on a good track? was likely to be finalised, and how many years and months have been, has there been of delay we're currently exper experiencing, <clears throat> and when are you expecting to have the tank plan uh, uh, finalised? And what does this mean in terms of uh, lost opportunities for upgrading the rules for this area? Can we have one more question, Zach, Mr Chairman? Yeah. And will, will tank be superseded by one, one, one Kotahi plan? So, look, I, 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 <coughs> there's a good bundle of them there for you, James. Have a shot. <laughs> when, when, <laughs> uh, we got yeah. two minutes starting now. Yeah. <laughs> when the tank plan change uh, process was initiated in 2012, at the time the broad uh, project planning uh, envisaged about a five year process, uh, which would have taken us to 2017. Uh, for a variety of reasons, um, particularly in terms of uh, the, the resourcing and the intersection of that body of work with the, um, uh, the body of work the Council was also doing at that time on uh, Plan Change 6 on the Tuki Tuki uh, and the Rui Tanifa Water Storage Scheme, which uh, took longer uh, and took more of Council resources than that had, had been envisaged. Um, that pushed tank into a, a longer drawn out process uh, and then it wasn't really until 2019 that we got a uh, recommended plan change from the collaborative stakeholder group for the regional planning committee to consider. Um, I don't think we had anticipated it would take two full years for the regional planning committee to get to a point of notification but one of the learnings from that was that the regional planning committee itself hadn't been on the journey of developing the plan uh, while the community collaborative stakeholder group had, uh, and it meant that the ultimate decision makers were not uh, sufficiently well informed of the issues and options and the detail of the plan in, in order to make a, a decision to notify. Uh, those are the learnings which have fed into the uh, well, governance approach for Korte, uh, which is to see that those who ultimately need to decide to uh, adopt and notify uh, the plan uh, go on the journey from the very inception uh, of the project. So uh, there were some learnings along the way, uh, but certainly uh, it took much longer than expected. I think uh, the hearings themselves uh, were delayed in initiation to some extent because of COVID-related issues and extra time given to submitters. Uh, and also the drought uh, that we experienced through that period had an impact on some submitters and some grace was given to that. So that drew out the, the pre-hearing uh, process 
The hearings themselves uh, were run pretty efficiently, but with 6,000 <coughs> individual um, submission points, three weeks of hearings were necessary. And then I do think now the commissioners are taking longer than we had anticipated to finalise their decision, having been given uh, an extension by the Minister for the Environment of a further three months just in the last week. Uh, they themselves have been impacted by COVID, both in terms of health issues and also the logistics of being able to work together. So it, it has been, a, I guess, a, a succession of unexpected uh, issues that have resulted in this process taking uh, effectively 10 years to get to the point of a plan uh, that will uh, come back to uh, Council as having been resolved uh, uh, by the uh, independent hearings commissioners by the 31st of August. And will uh, our Kotahi intersect or overlap or supersede tank? So uh, the tank plan change was developed under the National Policy <coughs> Statement for Freshwater Management uh, of 2017. During the development of the tank plan change and after it was received by the Regional Planning Committee, uh, the Government uh, produced a revised National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management uh, 2020 that has additional requirements uh, that, that Council needs to uh, take into account and that Council uh, needs to um, uh, revisit. So uh, it is necessary by law that the tank plan change uh, be revisited as part of the Kotahi plan, uh, but the tank plan change does provide uh, the basis uh, for uh, that, that next uh, review because uh, substantial parts of the National Policy Statement uh, 2020 were already operative in the 2017 version, and an awful lot of the science and policy work uh, that we would expect to sit within Kotahi has already been traversed in this process. Um, but of course, uh, the opportunity for review will be for uh, the All Governors and the Regional Planning Committee in particular to determine whether or not uh, the, the policies, rules, etc. remain fit for purpose. Thank you. <clears throat> Will someone move that the uh, significant organisational activities looking forward through 2022 be. Martin? Yep. Second. Will, all those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. Carried. Call for my items not on the agenda. Enviro Centre. <coughs> Enviro Centre. Any others? Um, Balance Farm Environment Awards. Balance, yep. Heady Heady Stream Planting. <coughs> okay. All right. <coughs> consultation item seven. Consultation on the future of our coastline. <coughs> Uh, Council, this has been through several iterations and several discussions. Uh, should be a pretty straightforward item. Who's going to lead on this? Uh, this one's for Mr Dolly, and uh, Desiree's, yeah, right. Des 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 Desiree's going to lead us through. Right. Chris, over to you. I'll just introduce Desiree and sit next to you. <laughs> Kia councillors. Um, so, as uh, you'll see in the report, this is um, the latest version of the consultation document. Um, we, the consultation period will run from the 1st of July to the 31st. We're using a range of platforms to um, promote the consultation. There'll be a media release following the decision today. Um, there'll be a public notice in the paper on Saturday. There'll be some uh, social media posts, article in the Bay Bars, um, and uh, our web material. As well, we're sending a postcard to um, all the suburbs along the coastal um, areas, including Waimarama, um, to direct. So that'll go to the ratepayer and we'll direct them to the website to view the material and make a submission. Um, we have made two slight changes to the document that you have um, on Stella. Um, and that was in response to the meeting of the community panels last week. Um, we just, the inside front page, we've just um, remodeled and tried to make it clearer. They're a bit confused as to the proposal and we've um, added a sentence in the submission form about the scope. So I will just hand that around so you can see those changes. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Council Ormsby has a question. Thanks, Chair. Uh, kia ora, Desiree, Chris. Um, so this is the second time that we've had the consultation document. 
that is going to go out that you uh, want us to adopt. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Uh, we had a workshop early yep. uh, May and then another one in early June. Yep. And then yep. this is the really the third Third version. So what differences are actually made from, I say, audited opinion from the first document to what you're presenting us now? Without going into too much detail. Yeah. The auditor's opinion? So the first, the first major change is we're initially going down a um, 16, section 16 process. That's yep. Right. Yep. And we're now doing an 82A yep. process, so that's a key change. Yep. And I think we've taken on board some comments from councillors, yep. which has changed some of the language and made it clearer. The 82A has allowed more freedom in yep. the document than because yep. the 16 is very regimented, so we've got some more freedom. And we've also received feedback from our panel too around how they interpreted uh, the information. So I think there's been a raft of many changes from many locations, but the key one is that 16 to 82. And so just for looking forward, we will have to do a section 16 yep. consultation. Um, and do we have some timeframes around that? So that will most likely occur in the next LTP development. In the next LTT development. Okay, thank you. And that is outlined, I think. Uh, there's a timeline on page 8, I think, um, that breaks that down and shows how we intend to have it. Um, the section 16, which requires an amendment, it's the amendment to the long-term plan that requires auditing, and that's what um, the audit came back and said you need more financial information to allow an amendment. Mm -hmm. So this Sounds is really pre-engagement. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've got three questions, but continuing on um, in terms of Section 82, um, have you had advice as to the content of the concept of the document that you're tabling uh, as to its conformance, particularly with Section 79 1B, around um, the requirement to have costs and benefits listed? And financial information contained? Was what, what advice have you had about the probity of Section 82? So we did seek a legal opinion on the process around Section 16 through Simpson Greeson. Um, and then we and that's they actually proposed the two-step process, and then we've had feedback from Audit New Zealand. Um, and there um, a lot more relaxed about the material that we put out under Section 82 um, yeah. so that we haven't had a formal opinion or sure. a review of this. So you, you think you will be in compliance with 79 1B about um, uh, the um, uh, costs and benefits <coughs> uh, that, um, that are needed to be shown in the document? <coughs> Off the top of my head, I'd need to look at 79, but in terms of a proposal with advantages and disadvantages, that's what, and we have tried to beef that up following feedback from councillors sure. last time. Okay. Um, sure, perhaps I, I, I could help. So, um, uh, Section 79 1 uh, does assert that it is the responsibility of the local authority to uh, make in its discretion judgments about the degree to which cost and benefits are to be quantified. So um, you, in, you know, in this exercise, uh, are needing to, um, I, I guess, decide that, in your view, that at this point in time, it's appropriate to have this in-principle consultation, that it's not necessary uh, to have quantified all of those costs and benefits, sure. because there are subsequent steps in terms of the long-term plan, long-term right. plan amendment to make. So <clears throat> that section, by my reading, doesn't suggest that you must have the benefits and costs quantified. It's just that you need to use your discretion and make judgments about whether or not they need to be. Um, we're dancing on the head of a pin, but let's carry on. Um, um, can I take you to your paragraphs in the um, paper? It's the, um, not the uh, paper, item seven paper. Um, <clears throat> scope of consultation, 12, 13, and 14. Um, <clears throat> So the question is, um, uh, do we take, does the Regional Council take charge of coastal hazard adaptation between Clifton and Tong Tongoyo? Um, uh, and then at 14 we're saying um, uh, submissions that are out of scope include feedback on the content of the strategy. Um, I'm, 
um, I'm curious to know. For example, if I were a submitter and I uh, submitted that um, the strategy itself um, in promoting certain ac actions resulted in X, Y, and Z, would that be in scope or out of scope? So the question again? The question is, um, we, we've, in, in the paper, you're saying that there are certain uh, yeah. elements of submission that are considered out of scope and won't be accepted. It's strategy, so, yes. So what's the question? So the question is that you, which I'm posing to the staff, um, is um, what, how do you determine what's in and out of scope if you can't talk about the war? You can't talk about the strategy, mm -hmm. uh, and the strategy may re be relevant to a, a decision uh, to take charge of coastal hazard adaptation. So, um, to specifically comment on the, the strategy that's in the document, which of course is not an adopted strategy of any council, it simply ha has been adopted for the purposes of the Clifton to Tungoi strategy. Specific comment on that we're saying is out of scope. Yes. It's around whether one council, being the Hawke's Bay Regional Council, should take a leadership position. That'll give us confidence or not in developing all of the detailed material to then allow a second stage through an LTP amendment or a Section 16 process sure. to comment on the specifics of, okay. of an adopted strategy of this council. So when we say in the very first paragraph of the consultation document, this is an important step towards implementing the Clifton to Tongoya Coastal Hazard Strategy, how do you reconcile that? What, what do I think or think when I'm reading this and wanting to make a submission? I'm not allowed to talk about that, uh, and yet this is an important element in the decision. I don't get it. So, that, look, that's, that's the com complexity. Um, if we recall, the strategy was locked up because there was a lack of um, uh, clarity between the responsibilities of the various councils. And so we looked to... Um, free that up uh, through the uh, through the ASHA review, and then each of the councils made recommendations around that. So we're simply asking the community: Does it make sense for a single entity, being the Hawkes Bay Regional Council, to take a leadership position um, as opposed to three councils uh, managing the status quo? So that really is the is the question that we're asking. Yeah, but it's to implement the strategy. Yeah, okay. so, just, uh, so, so I'll ask my third question. Mr. Are you on your sixth? No, it's third. <coughs> um, can I take you to, um, I think it's page 10 of the consultation document itself. That's the uh, table. Um, have you got that? No, we'll just, we'll just get it. What's the question? So the question is, I, just, I don't know what status quo means. Um, is managed retreat the same as planned retreat? Um, is retreat the line the same as managed retreat? Can you help me with those questions? So certainly planned retreat is having a plan in advance to retreat. Managed retreat is less planned. Um, and retreat the line is small incremental steps. Um, so they all are nuanced. Um, perhaps it could be clearer. Um, but certainly we're, that's, that's the reason we've had the workshops to, to, to try and get that feedback. So, that, so they do have dif different definitions, but if you believe a common definition might be more useful in the context of this document... We, well, we I'm just, just that. That, that jumped out at me that these were things. And, and status quo, what, what does status quo mean? So the status quo is the current approach, where we have three different councils on the Clifton to Tungwe Coast all implementing different strategies with different priorities... Um, dealing with their communities independently and certainly what the ASHA review suggested is that there would be benefit in having a single entity being the regional council. Um, yeah, uh, so that's that, I, I get that part. But when I'm reading the table, yeah. I'm seeing um, status quo being what is delivered there being whatever's currently delivered there as opposed to who's doing it. Yeah, and then you've got... So there are options for delivering. Yeah. Do you see how that could be confusing, that, that if you don't have a definition of what status quo means there, uh, it's either nothing or something, yep. um, and, and it is the, the, the reader of this might struggle with that. I would have thought status quo is quite <coughs> self-explanatory, as well as the current status. 
but what chance. is it? Chair, could I perhaps help, help you out? I think what Councillor Curtin is driving at is that status quo in this context does have two meanings. One is the activity that's being delivered at the moment and also the entity or agency that's delivering it. Because at the yeah. moment, to Mr Dolly's point, there are three agencies delivering relatively right. independent interventions. So status quo would be both those interventions continuing yeah. as well as the, the individual. So so maybe that is something that, 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 that yeah. could benefit from... Uh, from an explanation. I think it's implicit in the document, <coughs> possibly if that's a source of, I see, yeah. a source of confusion. Sure, yeah. and and uh, just if that could be noted under the terms, that may help. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Next that. question eight. Um, that, that I've just about done there, although I did, I, I did wonder whether there was worth in um, identifying the, just to go back to compliance of 79B1 or 2, uh, to put some dollars in against what current status quo delivery actually is. So there's a sense, if you like, to the reader that um, these, the, the decision to, what are we saying? The decision to take on board this has a cost implication of some dimension. Um, uh, I just make that point that maybe we can just lift the, lift this document a little uh, to, to meet our obligations and to inform the reader. I have. Any other questions? Councillor Foss. Thanks. Um, the question that's been consulted on is a relatively simple question, but it does have far-reaching potential implications. And so to that, um, because in, in our paper, and you've discussed before, you know, you're sending these postcards out and you can't know, find the people at the time, but the, this is all, all about Tongiwa, Clifton to Tongiwa, excuse the pronunciation, <coughs> and you're making efforts to particularly contact those people. But the implications of this will obviously, from Blackhead to Aramona to Waimanama, you've mentioned, Wapadaki, Mahia. So what are you... How are you making efforts to contact those people, and in particular, um, those that may have holiday homes there or not permanent residence there? I, I guess uh, I know it's difficult, but it's this does have because I cannot. If this was to go ahead, it's it's very difficult to see it not changing after that moment before the other authorities go through their process. I'll just check one because we're not sending so the outside post of the impacted area. The postcards go to the ratepayer, so the yep. holiday homes would be covered. Um, Which ratepayers? The, the the ones likely to be impacted. So as right. part of the process, we spoke to Wairau District Council and Central Hawke's Bay District Council <laughs> about um, about the nature of this proposal, uh, and it, it applies to the area described at the Clifton to Tangawai area, but there is capacity to extend beyond. Now, to extend beyond, we need to go through another Section 16 process in each of those other areas. So we have an opportunity to consult specifically on the proposal at the time when there might be a desire for sure. the Regional Council yeah. to provide that but, but anyone, you know, this is the Regional Council asking people yeah. affected in a particular area yeah. about something, but someone, someone in Kuru can respond to this if they so choose. Sure. Anyone so the key is for them to be aware of it. So can I suggest... Much of these smaller communities have groups or, I don't know, body corporates or, or, or a champion, even volunteer fire brigades, some of them, things, and rescue uh, life savers. <coughs> if we could just reach out, even on, just the, on the on, online stuff, because I am aware of some of these, particularly those locations there, who are submitting on other territorial authorities' various plans, um, and much of it was a surprise to many of those members of the implications of what some of those other councils are proposing, this would be the same. I ex fully expect, uh, uh, I agree that it's a longer time, but once this train leaves the station, I really can't see it turning back. All right, any other questions? Mike? Good, right. so just in regards to uh, consultation with, with Mana Whenua, so I, I do believe that there has been conversations had up to this point, but where are they showing up within the consultation period itself? So I guess I can start with the general project, uh, of course, is a partnership with Tangata Whenua uh, in itself. And we have acknowledged through the project and uh, through presentations to, I believe, both the RPC and the Māori Committee that we need to do additional work around engagement with Mana Whenua. So that is a specific work stream. 
And there's also a specific work stream around Motoronga Māori as well. Um, and in terms of the specific uh, Tangata Whenua engagement around th this, there's around, I don't believe there's anything um, targeted. There was um, a survey done. So Rebecca, before she left on maternity leave, had that work stream and she had done some um, work. Maybe I think it was it went online. Um, I know Simon is meeting with Nikki Nati Kahanunu um, shortly to discuss it. Um, I think there is a whole work stream. I'm just not across it. Sorry. Yep. So they're the work streams within the, in the project. Um. Okay. Any other questions? Up here. I'm just subsequent to <coughs> committee member Mike's question around. Could we get some visibility on that? If you could circulate that that information, that'd be grateful. Thank you. All right, I'm looking for someone to move. <coughs> Councillor Orms, would you move? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to Seconder. move. Seconder. Jacqueline? All right, any discussion? I think we've been over this many times. So, Martin? Yeah, look, um, is it, I think the mover speaks first. Yeah, well, do you just speak? Yeah, yes, oh, I will quickly. Um, just that um, it would be um, adventure advantageous to have those clarifications of what status quo means mm -hmm. um, and that also that we're aware that we've got another process to go through that's a lot more um, complex and in depth that asks those harder questions um, but for now I, I see this as just an introduction to see if we do that further work or not. Kia ora. Councillor Williams. Yeah, thank you. Look, I, I, yeah, tote. Uh, what about the seconder? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I actually just wanted to say um, I think you've covered the engagement really well. So you've got some good marketing streams or however you want to explain it to, to get the message out there. So well done on that. Thank you. Yeah. Third time. Yeah. Councillor Williams. Yeah, look, thank you. I, I see this as a toe in the water. Uh, it's, it's sort of reading the... It's a sort of a... Reading the uh, the temperature of the community for Hawke's Bay Regional Council taking charge. So the strategy is what the strategy is. You know, you call it. It's this cup. Who's holding the cup is what this consultation is about. Not what is the cup. Uh, that said, uh, I do share Councillor Curtin's concerns to an extent that it is a little bit confusing. Why are we being asked about this when what is the cup is for another day? Why are you even knocking on my door? Um, why don't you do it all together? And bearing that in mind, that we are just sort of you know, doing that, um, that gauge of, of community uh, temperature or reaction to us taking charge, I do think we need to be a bit tolerant about issues of scope of submissions and to suggest that submissions are, are, you know, out of scope will not be accepted, I think is a bit severe and a better response might be, um, thank you for your submission, this is a submission that we think would be better um, directed to the process down the track on the nature of the strategy, and we would you know, recommend that you keep your powder dry and come back and talk to us through the future long-term plan process. Uh, do you still want to come and talk to us? You know, so in other words, it's a bit more just, you know, because if they are having the same sort of confusion um, that I think rightly to an extent troubles uh, Councillor Curtin, um, We've kind of opened the door to that by getting an audit, audit opinion that said we needed to split this process. So it is a bit confusing. So it is just not be too severe about it. That, that's my point. The other speakers? Thank you, Mr Chair. Do I have so five surprising. or ten minutes? What's <laughs> oh, you've got 30 seconds. Why you <coughs> take advantage of it, it'll probably turn out to be an hour. But let's start uh, with 30 seconds. Look, um, um, uh, I reluctantly um, uh, support moving towards a discussion. I, I, I would refrain from calling it a consultation because it's not. Um, I would have much preferred if we'd framed it differently and said, we'd like to hear your views uh, and gone about it in that way. We would have ended at the same point. And I certainly, following on from Councillor Williams' observations, that I don't think we constru should constrain any submission in any <coughs> shape or form. We just got it. It's a submission. It doesn't matter. Um, let's have it. Um, and hear, hear what people have got to say. It's hard enough getting a submission, uh, let alone trying to constrain them. Um, I, I am troubled um, by the lack of 
information going forward, and taking again from Councillor Williams' analogy, putting a toe in the water. Unfortunately, a consultation process doesn't allow us to put the toe in. We've got to put our uh, knee, uh, our whole body in for consultation, and, um, and and that's the option. That's why my own view is that we possibly should have uh, gone down another road uh, rather than call it consultation. Um, there are other elements too, and um, I could I won't uh, bore you for the next ten minutes on those, and they're to do with uh, the relationship between taking on this task and our own internal or our own policy, our own coastal policy, coastal environment policy, um, because the steps that are outlined in the document, in many respects, uh, uh, t directly contravene those that those those policies and not not only that the national uh, uh, policy statement as well so those things are not stated in the consultation document and um, again we go in we're asking a submitter to come forward in a deficit of information and understanding of what they're being asked to do and uh, they're my reservations but okay let's go with this and see what comes out the other side <clears throat> well, I'll just have a few comments. <clears throat> My view is that in this particular case, there's a higher level of uh, uh, ratepayer awareness of the issues in these particular areas than is generally the case about other issues which the Council goes out and talks to on. I've heard on a number of occasions at meetings of the public <clears throat> in, along the coastline concerned where ratepayers have said, why don't we just have one Council talk to us? Uh, uh, because both the Hastings District and the Regional Council turned up <clears throat> and had different views about what should be done because they had different perspectives. And that's what people wanted. <clears throat> I think also about the strategy. There's been a, a great deal of public engagement about this and there are pockets of the community out there who are well informed of what the strategy is all about because they've been engaged in over a period of years. And I think they are well informed to be able to see the difference between the structure and the strategy. <clears throat> so I... I in another situation, I would have been uh, a little more cautious. But in this, we have, I think, in some areas, a very well-informed uh, 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 group of people who are aware of what's going on. Um, <clears throat> I'm a bit uh, uh, disappointed. I thought we could have been further down the track with something firmer here. But the OAG has made this, uh, put the foot down. We just have to accept that. <clears throat> so I think we are completely. Com I think we are happy with our compliance with the law because they've said the OEG seen all of this stuff, and had they have had a concern, I'm sure they would have told us. They have not. Uh, so I think it's a good thing, and I think it's time to move on. So I'm happy to support this. And uh, to that, I'll put the question. All those in favour will say aye. 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 Contrary, no. Any abstentions? Carried. <laughs> right. Well done, team. Thank you very much for your work. <clears throat> and I'm sure you don't need a resolution to tell you to think about the words that uh, have been raised. The paper does. Exactly. Yep. <clears throat> okay, Biosecurity Working Party, who's on seeing this? This is come to the table. Mark and Lauren. Mark and Lauren. Yes, not here. <clears throat> This is, although it's down as a decision item, <clears throat> uh, we're not actually going to make a decision because we're going to go and talk to people, as been suggested before, and consult. And when we consult, we're not having any opinions because we can't go out with predetermination. So it should be relatively straightforward. Mark and Lauren, where you go. <coughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Um, just a really quick update uh, just about the partial plan review process at the moment. We're at a really exciting stage of the review. So that is we are seeking approval to publicly consult. So as part of a legislative requirement for the process, we need to set up the Biosecurity Working Party, which uh, took effect as of last December, I believe. So during this, uh, during this time, we've basically just been going through a few um, scenarios and pushing through documents and just making sure that everyone's comfortable where we're sitting when it comes to what we're delivering to the public. And we have come up with our consult doc. That should have been um, included in the attachments to everyone today. So um, with the attachments that have been sent out to all councillors, are there any questions in terms of what we have produced? Good question. Any questions? Yeah. Yep. Councillor yeah. Ormsby. So uh, I suppose I, I see it in a different angle where we don't just pass this through because it's a consultation document that you're asking us to question. Yes. Yes. Okay. 
Um, so from the document, it talks about possibly who will pay um, when we go through the consultation process. And we start to discuss in there the split between the general and the targeted rate. Yeah. Yep. And it's also acknowledged in the paper that currently we're going through a rating review. And those things will be determined as we move through that process Correct. before we, um, we decide on the possum control yes. um, changes. All right. yep. So if you keep that in mind, is it wise to put percentage ranges in the document given we haven't gone through the process ourselves as a council? Yeah, um, so that's a difficult one. Under the Biosecurity Act, we are required to um, clearly show who the beneficiaries and exacerbators are and also indicate who should pay. Equally, we've already had quite a bit of engagement with key stakeholders, and obviously the first question they ask is, how much is it going to cost us? So it's a real rock. <laughs> you just heard the last <laughs> item, yes. <laughs> so we're trying to manage that the best we can, and we've, unfortunately Ian and Jess aren't here at the moment, but... Uh, we're also working with Chris, so the way we're going to approach it is um, give potential scenarios, but be very clear in the text that goes with it that that's a decision that's not going to be made until the revenue and finance policy review is completed. And through that process, my understanding is that will be consulted on publicly, yes. uh, so that's when we'll be also indicating that yeah, all those who submit on it, we can then notify them of this process as well, allow the, allowing them to then actually see the, the formal decisions that you will make as, as councillors, and they can also submit on that as well. Right. Um, sorry, supplementary. Chair. Sure. Um, it would have been really good to have presented to us in today's session the work that went into this, so the analysis. So is, is there a reason why we don't have the person in charge of that review come and present to us? Because that... That forms the basis of what goes into the consultation document. Are you referring to the cost benefit, benefit analysis? analysis? Yeah. So that that was included yeah, that, in that, the. That is. In, yeah, it is. Yeah, it was, but but there's no one here to help answer those questions. Okay. Yeah. So, what I did have questions about from that was. Um, there was a lot of information in there indicating that the benefit is for rural. Because right, it looked at the economic analysis. Um, and so it might be confusing for someone who wants to um, submit to really understand, well, who benefits from this? And therefore, uh, are able to give a more accurate um, view on, therefore, the rate payers being either general or targeted. So do you... So my question is, after all that, my question is, do you feel that the consultation document reflects who benefits and then therefore who should pay, possibly? I might jump in here and say I believe that it does. Um, it might not necessarily be to a very low level, might not get down into the weeds, but it does um, very much state that it's a biodiversity benefit, which I think if you look at that from a broader perspective, it's very much a case of everybody wins there. So in terms of who pays and how much, we can't determine that at the stage, but in terms of benefits, biodiversity benefits for the region, in which case everybody is then benefiting from that. So in my mind it does, but I can have another perspective that might not necessarily. One of the other complexities around it is, although the agricultural industry does benefit from it, a lot of that is actually down to the impacts of TB, and, and that is managed by Osprey in the Northern Ireland region, um, who already play, pay through uh, levies um, and whatnot. So we have to be cautious about what is the aim of this program versus uh, Osprey, and we've been through that a few times. At the end of the day, I think what we've discussed and we're hoping to do quite targeted um, through the comms plan is around what are the benefits overall from this program to go alongside the document. Because the proposal, uh, apart from those really affected parties, people might not necessarily pick it up and read it in full. So we're hoping to do, well, we are going to do some really targeted uh, media releases and comms work to clearly explain 
what the purpose of the program is and who, why, who will benefit from it. Thank to you. make that clearer. Yeah, thank you. James? Chair, perhaps I, I could just add to give some comfort to uh, to council that uh, obviously when the um, uh, this comes back, there will be final decision making by both the working party and also uh, ultimately council uh, to adopt any uh, changes to the RPMP. Um, in doing, uh, undertaking that decision making, it will be important for uh, all the decision makers to have an understanding of the cost and benefits, etc. So, um, if it's helpful, um, I'm sure we could bring back the uh, the authors and provide further discussion prior to any final decision to ultimately change the plan alongside submissions from stakeholders as well. And if I could add another layer of that too, that uh, I'm normally one who objects to papers coming directly to council, but on this occasion I was persuaded it was worthwhile doing so, because if we don't, it then goes into the electoral cycle and past that and just ricochets off into next year, and the work is actually quite urgent for other planning reasons. So uh, uh, the normal process uh, uh, was gone around for the quality of the outcome at the end, on the uh, benefits and costs uh, thing, we did have a discussion, I'm reminded by uh, Leanne in December, a uh, bit of a while ago, but uh, could have been here, but I pick up on James's point that it's a, it's a fundamental point, and uh, when we come back to making a decision at the time, we'll have those people available to you. The last comment I make in response to your questions, uh, uh, Council B is that if you put out a, a document that had nothing in it because we had made a decision, the people who are reading and trying to respond to it would have a real struggle. Yeah, but you've got to you've got to then put a, a document out that has something in it which we don't have, you know, which we haven't signed off on. They can in fact you know, begin to grapple with the issues. But as long as it's clear, for example. <laughs> it's, it's kind of, it's kind of two together, one after the other. But it's just, uh, 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 so I just think it's been a, a struggle for them to get the, the balance of this. But I'm I'm perfectly happy that people get get the sense of the idea. A decision's coming. Are we going to do something different here or not? How do I feel about this? Am I prepared to pay more or less? Where does it fit? I think we've got enough in there to make a an informed decision. My view, anyway. Now the question, Jacqueline. Thank you, Chair. Um, more of a comment, but there is one question at the very end. So my comment really is um, is first to say how much in support I am of this document um, and the work you have done on it, because um, this is this is not just a consultation um, it, to change up the rates and make a change. This is a uh, make a change to our biosecurity, but this is actually a massive shift into changing the mindset of our ratepayers that this is to biodiversity focus. And that, that to me, is, is huge um, and, and really, really positive for the region. Um, because of that, so my question's coming now, because it really has to be a change in mindset for people to move away from what is Osprey's responsibility and think that this is only benefiting the farmers, um, the marketing is hugely important. So my question is, are we actually going to see these videos and media releases that are going out? Are we seeing them at all and reviewing them? So in terms of them being reviewed today, no, they're not available. However, for future planning, we are planning two social media posts a week and as well as also a video that we have um, had approval to use. So there will be um, quite a heavy social media um, target range, um, but in terms of the content involved, is that something you'd like to have more of an overview with? I think it's really important because, um, you know, the, again, it's, it's, you know, this is not about biosecurity anymore. I mean, I know it is. I know we are. But we are really coming in hard with a more of a biodiversity focus. And that's a huge shift mm. to the plan um, and to our, you know, our management of it. So I, I just think that council should be not involved in the management of it, of course, but I do think Council should review this marketing material um, no somewhat, problem. at least view it, just as you viewed the consultation. Sure, I just think it would be an easy thing for, <clears throat> when it comes to the material, what you going to produce, that Chief Executive of the team can make sure it's circulated to councillors for observation and comment. Perfect. Absolutely. Thank you, no problem. Uh, um, Michelle. Um, it's a technical question. Um, so when you're talking about the um, the monitoring uh, lines, um, what's the hectare um, 
in comparison to, to the monitoring line. So, so why I'm asking this is that um, Osprey with the forestry, um, 70 hectares has, is monitored with one line, as opposed to um, outside Osprey, 500 to 700 hectares per monitoring line. In the forestry, um, and 4,700 hectares, this is in Mohaka, 63 lines are set at 630 wax tags. Um, and that's where you derive your RTC from. So how many wax tags are chewed by the possums tells you, only possums are in there, apparently, um, as opposed to outside the Osprey areas, that's 7,000 hectares and nine lines. So my question is, are you going to be monitoring up to the same level as Osprey? Because there's there's a huge difference in the hectares, and it also impacts on the costs. If you want a true RTC, it it, it involves intensive monitoring. Yep. So the way the way we've done monitoring in the past is we've done it at a property level, and the property level or size dictates how many lines are going to be uh, placed within that area. The, the monitoring protocol, the, the bigger the land parcel becomes, the less lines that are in it. Um, that's the, the technical protocol that we follow. However, I could not answer off the top of my head. I'd actually have to pull that, that protocol out to see um, how many lines fall in each hectare. And I, I can update you on that afterwards, um, if you wish. Yeah. But um, I guess the, the fundamental difference here is this will be moving from land occupier responsibility, where we're out there primarily monitoring, uh, using um, chew cards and tags and the like, uh, to contract it delivered. So uh, that's more like the Osprey model. Um, so we um, work closely in partnership with Osprey and would likely be using something very similar to them. So that there will be a, a change in how we monitor. So there's some <coughs> same level yeah, where you would expect it yeah. to be. Yeah. Perhaps that's because of the TB outbreak with Osprey yeah. being in there, be more intense. Yes, yeah. yeah, it's always yeah a different model for contract managed work uh, versus... Um, more surveillance. Any other questions? Uh, Councillor Williams? Yeah, thank you. Um, just, yeah, I've been looking at the Act uh, alongside the paper, and I've got to say the Act isn't um, the best drafting in, in the statute. It's got all these things that the proposal must have in it, but it doesn't say that what you consult on being said proposal must, in a, like a, in a consultation document under the Local Government Act has got this prescriptions as to what that's got to contain. This has got prescriptions as to what a proposal must contain, but it doesn't say you have to have all of that and what you consult on. As far as I can tell, you know, I, like Councillor Ormsby, uh, I will get to the question. I'm a little bit concerned about um, the funding issue because there's a $3.5 million time bomb sitting in here that's about to explode on Napier and Hastings communities. They may not see coming. And, and, and I'm just wondering um, if we're going to go there on funding analysis, whether we actually need to be a bit more uh, direct and, and less obscure. Um, for example, could we say, bottom of page 70, or page 19, it's got the council there considers, it says, the council considers, well, it's actually the working party at the mm -hmm. moment, um, that overall the beneficiaries of the, uh, of the activity are spread across the region. As a result, the current funding will need to be changed to reflect this. And I, I, I think, you know, if we're going to go there, we should be saying something like, which could mean that urban uh, communities shoulder a much greater funding burden for this than previously has been the case. So, you know, because otherwise I'm not reading it, I think it's cool. But, but, you know, literally, this is, this is possibly two, two or three million dollars of rates hitting Napier and Hastings that they're not paying at the moment. And, and if we're going to go there, I think we should need to be a little bit more... And this isn't really a question, is it? It's more I just, comment, no, it is a question. I just want to stop you there. And, yeah. What do you uh, think I just, I just want to hear your views on that. And, uh, James, I think it's a fair enough point <clears throat> that if we do feel that this proposal is going to incur costs on people, we should be more specific rather than just say, may change. I mean, that's... Uh, doesn't tell you anything, does it? Unless you're the cynic, you work out, oh, they're going to bomb me for rates. But uh, we don't want to be like that, do we? And again, I, I, I wish, I guess, Jess and Ian were here to help answer this because we've gone back and forth a lot between what we can do in regards yeah. to the revenue and finance policy, and it has not 
uh, has not helped us along the pathway. It's been a, a real sticking point for us. So um, uh, in a normal process, I think we'd be very upfront about um, how much it's going to cost and, and who pays. But uh, that currently seems to conflict with the revenue and finance policy. Um, and it's it's the, the two acts just sort of well, couldn't uh, you colliding. Just, <laughs> just be a bit more direct about that in the document say, like, this will all need to be determined through the rating review that we're undertaking and through a future long-term plan. But one of the possible implications is that there is this shift to urban communities to a much greater extent. And, and for example, um, we might be putting 60 and 80 percent, 20 and 40 percent through that process. Yes. Um, so that process is a bit like the coastal one. That process is still to come. But just bear in mind uh, that this isn't just all about, you know, it's wonderful, we're going to get rid of possums. Yeah, completely agree. And within the consultation document, we do stipulate that there, there is a, a potential switch in that um, and wording around to that effect that we have to wait for the revenue and finance policy. Yeah. However, we've also been working closely and again met today uh, with Chris and co in regards to providing a scenario to clearly show what that might look like. And I think where we've landed is we'll do two scenarios, the current scenario versus if we were to switch to provide those opportunities for people to physically see that, um, where that, the cost would lie for uh, a ratepayer. And so that will go out with the public consultation document alongside the other documents um, when we release it for public consultation. Okay. So there's also so just a larger review. Well, take, excuse me, just... Uh, just can, James. can I just 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 emphasise that fact that there is additional documentation to come here, which I think is going to provide some comfort. Um, and it's just unfortunate it couldn't be provided in the time frame uh, from when this left the working party through to uh, today's meeting. Uh, but as, as I understand it, um, following the meeting this morning, uh, now being worked on, I, I do think that in here, uh, in the existing text where it refers to uh, that it is proposed to be funded primarily by a general rate, that we could elaborate on that to the extent, uh, as Councillor Williams had suggested, that uh, that would mean that uh, the majority of the costs of possum control in the region would therefore would would be met by the general rate. The general rate payer. I'm being careful with wording here because <coughs> there are subsequent question, uh, decisions you will need to make about how that's apportioned. But the general rate payer, as opposed to rural landowners. Mm. Okay. Only if, if you get my drift. I think mm -hmm. we can play with some wording there just to right. emphasise that point. Okay. And to go back to the sort of the prior point between the Local Rating Act, uh, Local Government Act, and uh, the Biosecurity Act, adopting a change to the RPMP does not legally compel you to right. fund this through the LTP. Okay. Yeah. It does create a situation, however. Uh, in which if you decide in the LTP not to fund this activity because you've got other priorities and that may well be the decision following consultation, you will need to go back and, re and rewrite the RP or re amend the RPMB to reflect those funding decisions. So they are just two separate processes. We can't change that fact. Uh, it, it does make some logical sense that you would make the funding decision after you've made the decision to undertake the activity, not the other way around, mm -hmm. uh, and, and just to be so you're absolutely comfortable, those funding decisions and those rating burdens are a subsequent decision that you can take without feeling like this decision Pretty under the RPMP it. is boxing you into a corner, okay. other than the extent to which it creates an expectation in the community that that's the direction of travel for the policy. Okay. Just before you go, does that satisfy your question? Yeah, I don't know, but I did have a, something that was more like a question to ask as well. Oh, that's a novel change. <laughs> well, it was just really just to clarify that the changes to Rule 14 and Objective 11, just comparing those with the existing plan, principally seem to be introducing the words with no more than three possums in a single monitoring line. That seems to be the, the that's correct. That's the main change to those rules. Have, yeah, from from memory, yes, yes. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And then my cons what I just wanted to clarify was it says here that however once possums have been actively managed, the rule no longer applies. Um, that active management means, in other words, we've got the possum control scheme up and running on a contractor model. That's what those words mean? Yes. Okay. What if we uh, were tardy or slow in that for some reason? That would mean that the the, the uh, the owner control model with no more than three possums in a single line could stick around for a while, right? Yep, so the, 
it's anticipated to roll this out over a series of years because yeah. of the cost we can't go and um, undertake possum control um, through contractors across the entire region in one, one go. So we'll be building up over a three to five year period depending on, on funding. So the existing model stays um, and it's tough luck for those who, who, who are towards the end of the process and have to keep monitoring possums, uh, controlling possums themselves. However, it would be a rolled out process, um, converting from occupier responsibility over to um, contractor model. So that's why we require that existing program to stay in place until that date. Do they get any kind of double whammy where they're paying for the scheme but not getting the benefits of it? Or is it more likely to fall on the urban communities in the meantime? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. So okay. can you, there will, oh, just, All right, thank you. Okay. Councillor Foss, do you have a question? Uh, no, I was just going to mention that there's a much larger discussion going on about that urban. Um, just that maybe that gives a wee bit of context to the the cost of that, which will be a new or moved cost. It's happening a bit later on. This was constrained because of the nature of what we're allowed to review. So all that other material is going to it is on the way. It's coming yeah. for the timing of that. It's the larger review. Yeah, I guess another one point to make is. Uh, the program is largely focused on the rural area because we can only really undertake compliance on properties that are larger than four hectares. In fact, um, it's generally larger than that. In reality, it's more like 20 hectares. We have undertaken urban possum control programs, but that's been a once-off. Uh, this program really does bring the urban areas back into that, where they would be managed also by contractors. So the urban population are going to directly benefit from this. Councillor Curtin. Um, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, continue to be troubled, as you know. You have life. had a troubled day, actually. You really haven't, you? Um, and it's, 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 this, is, this is the uh, issue that is troubling. Um, we're selling a Tesla. Uh, we're, we're, we're dressing it up as a Tesla, and it's a mini minor. We're saying biodiversity. Um, the reality is that uh, this is biosecurity, yeah. It's aimed at uh, ensuring that sh uh, cattle and deer farmers don't incur this loss. That's the reality. There is significant biodiversity gain, but we ought to be saying that uh, here's the package. Not only is it possum, but it's mustelids. Um, we need to identify the biodiversities that we're looking to protect and where they are. To me, we continue this, and it's gone on for two decades, this nebulous thing called biodiversity that we're looking to protect by, by addressing one pest. That's, that's simply not sufficient, in my view, to talk to the public about. Um, and I'm interested, James, in the next tranche of information coming forward um, that gets back to the 70-30 split and the 3.5 mil that the public expected to pay, you've told me that we're going to go and shoot some possums up on the hill under contract. Um, well, I, I don't know if it's worth 3.5 million. Um, so my point is this. Have we an opportunity... This is the question. I, I'm not, I have a question. I've, I've been holding my breath Here's for about question. two minutes now. Here's the question. Is there an opportunity to wrap biodiversity up more to identify our control measures for, for mustelids and other, other pests and put it in the biodiversity framework as opposed to we're just going out there and knocking possums over as fast as we can. Chair, could I have a, a crack at that? Mark, Mark's far more expert in these matters than I am, so he, 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 can, he can supplement it. Um, just note that this council has taken a leading role nationally in trying to move beyond single species possum control to wider biodiversity animal pest control uh, with um, uh, Cape to uh, and Puteri Tane and of course um, uh, our Mahia <coughs> program as well. That has come at the cost of, to some extent, our um, uh, our possum control program uh, as we've tried to spread a reasonably finite dollar further and part of this exercise is resetting to ensure that uh, the uh, I think what is 
would be considered the most damaging animal uh, pest from both a plant and bird species point of view, um, given that rats and mustelids tend not to eat native vegetation, but to eat native birds, but possums eat both. Um, that this is a priority organism for uh, for control, so we're kind of resetting on that. But we are obviously continuing uh, with um, uh, some maintenance programs in those other programs. And I think uh, with the new national policy statement on Indigenous biodiversity uh, coming down the line and no doubt increasing expectations for us to do more on biodiversity, one of the many uh, additional funding challenges and opportunities coming through our next long-term plan on Beyond will be expanding off the back of this exercise a broader multi-species biodiversity protection effort. So um, I, I think the concerns you raise about the narrowness of the focus here are, are, are fair to some extent in terms of achieving the biodiversity benefits, um, but I think in our, um, our judgment this is the priority area to be putting that additional effort at this point in time, particularly given what, what has happened with the recurrence of, uh, of the prevalence of, of possums in parts of the region. Um, but you know, I, I think from a staff point of view, we do feel like this uh, this delivers genuine biodiversity benefits of benefit to the whole community. In the same way that we provide specific and targeted funding on um, uh, farm properties for highly erodible land, that brings broader benefits by water quality, etc. Which many people in the urban environment will never actually directly physically experience themselves because it's upper catchment are in waterways that they don't uh, actually recreate in. But it brings broader benefit, and, and I think um, because the benefits do attribute to all of society, uh, the sustainability of um, you know of our ecosystems and our environment more broadly, we do think that there is a strong case here for a general rate funded component. But there is also um, some uh, landowner benefit as well, including the biodiversity enhancement of an individual property. Hence, the proposal to retain 20 to 40 percent uh, of, of of land landowner contribution here. So. I, mean, I think we're, we're navigating the very concerns that you have raised. Mark, would you like to add some supplementary advice to this uh, to reassure the troubled uh, Councillor Kerr? The, the only other thing I'd add to this is just to keep in mind that osprey manage bovine tuberculosis. They don't care about possums. They care about bovine tuberculosis, and possums are a vector. The moment an area is declared free of bovine tuberculosis, they cease all possum control. What's happening in other regions is they have nothing coming in behind that. Possums are going back to pre-control levels where they're having a significant impact on biodiversity. So we need to focus on what this programme is wanting to achieve. It's not there to protect farmers from bovine tuberculosis. That's already being achieved through Osprey. Its actual main focus truly is biodiversity. Now I've seen the impact with my own eyes when I've done the possum patrol. It is immense. Possums have a significant impact on biodiversity. I can't overstate that. The only other thing I'll say is, yes, we're being very focused on possums here. I think we need to be because we're at a critical point where if we don't get this right, we could be in quite a position where we're choosing to cease possum control altogether if we don't get this right because possums will increase to a point where we're doing initial control again across large parts of the region, which is incredibly expensive, probably beyond what we can afford. So we need to get in there now to prevent that. The other point I'd like to make is we are absolutely thinking longer term about how we can then add another uh, predators and or even look at rolling through uh, to possum eradication if possible. And there is external funders also already talking to us about those potential opportunities. So it really sets a platform. We're just, I think we need to be really focused here about what we're going to achieve instead of talking for too big a picture and, and overselling what we're actually going to achieve. Thank you for that. City Councillor, you can be rest assured you've got a choice between a Tesla or a Mercedes S-Class. <laughs> Councillor Taylor. I was just going to ask to move it with comment. It's open yeah, <coughs> questions. Yeah. I'll second I'll, I'll, it. I'm just going to... But, but I, the manu, aren't they part of biodiversity? So, you know, Neil's got a point. If you, and there's an unbalance, you know, it's about balance. And, and if you wipe out all the possums, then, then the rest, yeah. you know, 
Sorry. They're passionate about it. That's a pet. Um, yeah. Mustelids and rats, you know, you could be doing a double whammy. You could be hitting the possums and the mustelids. Um, my brother does a double double trapping. So you get the possum and, and rats. And, and the other problem is cats. Cats are um, uh, feral cats. They're, they're wiping out our, our bird population. So, um, you know, he, he does have a point. It's about the balance. And you can't say biodiversity with not, not including our money. So, yeah. Thank you. Councillor Taylor, are you moving? Yes, please. Councillor okay. Foley, second. Do I speak? Yeah, I do actually, and I hope this is the first stepping stone to further um, biodiversity development and protection in, in, in our region. And I just wanted to say, um, oh, well, actually, the CE stole my thunder and pretty much said everything I was going to say. So I think it really is just about saying, you know, this council, we want to put three things in our focus, climate change, biodiversity and water. Yeah. Um, and, and so, therefore, I think it is a, it's something that we all carry. We all want better water. We all want to do something about climate change, and we would love to see more more um, flora and fauna in our environment. So I fully support this work, um, and I look forward to the future and seeing what we can achieve from it. Thank you. Thank you. Before I call Councillor Foley as a second, uh, second speaker, I'll go to Apia because I overlooked him for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, that's right. Um, and through you, Mr. Chair, my, my questions are, are reasonably straightforward. So I, I, I'm reading through the paper and I'm seeing that um, follow up decisions from Council around LTP allocations are still yet to be made based on the comments in yep. uh, number six. Cool. And down in 9.3.1, with regards to the review and financing policy, will staff be making any recommendations to the review of the uh, revenue and financing policy as a result of the um, working party? Yeah, I'm not sure if Chris or someone's yeah. better answering that, but my understanding is we have to be cautious about making recommendations, is it? Correct. I, I believe it has to be a non-biased approach. Yeah. We can't have any in, um, impact. On well, the then, then my question will convert to the wider group around how do we capture the concerns of staff in the review process? You just bring us all. I, 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 <laughs> sorry, Chair, if you'll indulge. So, um, uh, as I think, uh, councillors, and hopefully, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Tapani, you were party, I think, to the workshops on review and financing policy recently. Um, there is a, a proud history in this nation of litigating uh, council rating decisions and therefore uh, great care is taken to follow the statutory steps, which require open-mindedness and a whole bunch of very principled considerations. The matters that have arisen from this exercise, including uh, what the Working Party has um, d discovered and uh, is thinking, uh, will feed into that process. And I think we've just been cautious to say that uh, a recommendation might be a bit strong. Um, there, are some, there are some ideas here. The ideas will be taken into account and Council will, will, will weigh those against all of the other matters that they are required to weigh, uh, you are required to weigh, in setting rating decisions and setting the new revenue and financing. And no rates. predetermination and uh, decisions being made in advance. Thank you. And I'll tidy up my language as I go forward. Kia ora. Councillor Foley. Um, thank you, Chair. <coughs> um, yeah, for obvious reasons, um, very much in support of this um, consultation proposed. Um, <clears throat> for some six months now, the Working Party has been having similar discussions to what we've um, been having today and, 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 and got to the, um, the recommendation we've got to. Thank you very much to staff. Special mention to Campbell Leckie, who's no longer with us and <coughs> down in Stewart Island, probably about now. Um, not only for the work on this, but, but for many years, uh, Hawkesbury Regional Council has been held in high regard, regard around its possum control. Um, a huge successful program when it was first implemented, uh, got possum control numbers down significantly low. Um, but as we, as we know and are aware, those numbers are trending um, back up. Um, 
it just so happens at the same time, uh, rural landowners, uh, the urban um, communities as well, have got really on board with um, planting, planting urban streams, fencing off waterways, um, and, and planting on farms as well. And so those two things in combination, um, uh, all these new plantings, rising possum numbers, you know, potential conflict there. And so I think the timing of, of this is actually um, crucial to, to review. And um, we suggest a, a change in, 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 in our possum c control. And this is the, the kind of the, the, the best recommendation we've come up with. And so happy to go to public and um, get their sense of, of um, whether we should go ahead with this. With regards to the funding, um, so farmers now, as, as you, you should all be aware, do already um, spend a lot on possum control. They pay for um, either contractors or doing it themselves, baiting stations, purchasing the bait. And so there's no reason why rural landowners can't continue with some form, form of funding um, um, and, and uh, I guess, um, co-contribute with with the urban ratepayer going forward, but let's <laughs> let's worry about that. We can get to it. Um, first and foremost, let's get the feedback from the public around this um, this proposal change, and then go to the next step from there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Holmes. Chair, um, I just want to total call um, the nature and what's been said already um, through our mover and seconder, and um, thank our Kaimahi for the all the work that's gone into this. I, I found this thoroughly interesting. Um, which is why I had so many questions. So, um, you know, that tension there is because you want to make sure this gets out right. Yes, yep. and, that's exactly and so that's what you've asked us to do, to look at the at the consultation document and say, right, what's missing? Where are the holes? What do we need to fix up so it's more robust when it goes out? So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is we all want to, to see the progression in, in the enhancement of our biodiversity. Um, it's just how that looks, how we invest, and so all these questions are really pertinent for us to get this as um, you know, fit for purpose as possible. Um, but in terms of the direction we're going, I'm happy to total call what's been done and presented here, um, particularly picking up from the comments, which I hope will be included in terms of the clarity um, and the, um, yeah, the clarity around... Uh, the step we're in, the process we're in right now, and how that could change given where we're at with our revenue financing policy um, rating review, um, as well as what changes. So, we talked about status quo already in the last item. What status quo and what's really being proposed here that's different, um, and how that may impact the different rate, rate payers. So, um, based on that, I think we just have a more um, robust and honest document to put out there. Kia ora. Okay. Councillor yeah. Williams. Thank you. I was just very briefly going to say the same point. I think this document could be sharper as to potential implications, but conversely uh, a little more hedged on just how locked and loaded those are and that there is a process to follow. So this is what could happen, uh, the, the, the greater burden on, on uh, urban um, and options would be, but those would need to be tested through future rating review and long-term plan processes. And if you make those two points clear, people can see the writing on the wall, they understand the implications, but are aware that there is this other process to go. To go. And so the language that I think is difficult in here, where it says the council considers, etc., etc., uh, I just think taking, you know, the council considers out, we don't consider anything as yet. Um, you know, the 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 the, pro the prospect is that would be a, a better way to, um, to, to to frame that. But with that, I just want to thank the working group uh, for all of the hard work that is being done, along with the staff, for getting us to this point. It's a hugely important issue. If we, okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour of uh, recommendations one to seven, please say aye. 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 Contrary, no. Abstentions? Carried. Let's move on to the item nine, report from the Māori Committee. Uh, Michelle and Mike, would you like to lead us on this? Hello, Mr Chair. Um, taken as read, um, sure. just, uh, uh, just to mention on item four, um, a Kaitaki board presentation by Paul Atapu. He's the chair of my party to 
Taya to Ki Turaki Rong. Uh, fisheries forum, on, forum, which is around customer and fisheries. <coughs> um, so there was a, a really enlightening um, uh, presentation or, or report from him. And um, with, the, with regard to the uh, restorative measure, measures around AFCO, um, we've got a scheduled mediation we, um, on the 5th of July with uh, restorative justice in AFCO. It's going to occur there. And um, in addition, uh, it was also mentioned by one of our uh, members, um, um, it was a call uh, to Rick Ma around three waters. And um, from Whanganui Rotu, from Mapi Robin, and, um, and they, um, we actually fully support the three waters reform. Um, the Hawke's Bay model, uh, the, the Drinking Water Committee, I was just reading the three waters website uh, the other day, and, and that Drinking Water Committee does not support Article 2 and provide for uh, for Tino Ranga Tiratanga. So um, I'm not quite sure where people are getting the idea from that we are in support of the Hawke's Bay model, and um, one of our members made that quite clear. Um, so that's, um, that's a quite all that we as a iwi are going to have to discuss and, and put out a statement around because I think it's in contrast to what everybody else is saying. Um, and I'll pass the other co-papa to Mike to speak to. Mike. Okay. Any questions around in regards to what Michelle just raised? We'll just go through the whole report. Probably. Okay, then just, uh, just on the item five, uh, just in the court, court tahi plan. Um, <coughs> This is more in regards to the position that Heather Tonga has taken. Uh, no issue with, with, with the Kotahi plan itself. Understand what it is, understand why it's here. Fully supportive of the council going out and consulting in regards to the Kotahi plan. The issue arises when we talk about partnerships. Of course, when we start to mention the word partnership and Kotahi, there's another connotation that takes place stops being about the plan and it becomes about the relationship and that somehow mana whenua have supported and been part of the plan. Quite clearly that has not been the case. We haven't developed the plan. Yeah. The plan has been developed. So I think there needs to be a little bit of consideration given about how it is promoted. Because if we stay down on the current pathway, Heta Tonga will not support and sit alongside councillors and say, we are your partner in this, because we can't. Our main function, my function here is to advocate for our people of Heta Tonga. I can't advocate and be a partner at the same time. It doesn't work, especially if I haven't contributed to putting the document together, or the whānau haven't contributed to putting the document together. So once again, fully supportive of the Kotahi plan. No-ish. Heretanga fully behind it. We will support that. What we struggle to support is this word partnership and where that all leads to. And we're starting to see that conversation developed out there in social media world. Uh, so this, I suppose, is just a bit of heads up. I think there's just a bit more conversation that we need to, need to undertake. I understand we have another workshop coming up. Yep. And eighth, and I think we just want to develop that a bit, bit more. Other than that, <laughs> and, and I'll just add, add, add one more, sorry, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, but in saying that, uh, when we went to the workshop, um, and, and we also made it clear to the councillors that um, we, what we found in the, um, the official summit that a lot of our people um, were uh, well, cautious of the Kotahi plan. Um, I will say that when I partook in the workshop, it was a blank page, and um, I was surprised. So, um, yeah, I did end up enjoying it. We'll just see how the journey goes. But, yeah, here's, here's a point. We, we, we advise and we, we support you to go and talk to our people. But Thank you. That I, I, I won't, I've, I've got a pile of questions I'd like to talk to both of you about on that but I'll defer that to after the meeting because I think it's a long conversation here. 
and uh, uh, just uh, so stand by with a, for a phone call, a cup of coffee, because uh, uh, that's a really worthwhile conversation. Yeah. So good news to hear support Katahi and yes. getting a Katahi plan. Great, we're on board with that. It's just got to work out how the language and the relationship. So side by side, one behind, one front, whichever it is, we'll work it out. We'll get this thing right. Okay. Any questions? Councillor Foss. Just uh, Michelle, just what you were saying, um, is, is, is the committee going to put out a press release saying you support three waters or you just we're have a different position than the Territorial Authority or something? Because as a council, we haven't really said too much about three waters. Oh, okay, so we've that Hawke's Bay three waters page, and so I've been, I've been reading them. It's got the regional council logo there as well as the <coughs> local, of the LTA. And so I've been, so I've been reading the the right. cases there, like the the, um, the Māori case and the Tangatifina case and the, the Morrison Low report. You know, so I've, I've I've read that, and it's about, I think for 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 us, it's about people reading the documents, reading the information, and then forming an opinion, not listening to it rhetoric, and. Um, and we've been on the journey, so you know, even caught it all about uh, Tangan to Fina weren't engaged. Uh, I think there was two years of engagement. So I was in the same workshops that the local government was. Um, <laughs> actually, more we were in more workshops. There were workshops down in Waitall. Um So yeah, what for <coughs> us, you know, for this, and I can only today speak on behalf of me. Um, but it's about we've been talking to the leaders of the airway in it. It needs to be a media statement coming out from, out from our people. Um, oh, but for us, committee. it's about the water. Uh, the committee did, um, Tanganui Arotu, did state that they support the three waters reform. And um, we had it discussed it as a whole. But I support their statement. I support their statement. Just, sorry, it's all about just, the water. There was my question, point. just the, that got, process. I just, there's an explanation need to be oh, mm -hmm. made. Go, sorry. James needs to make this about the use of the council logo. Yeah. Chair. Chair, uh, prior to the government announcing its intention to mandate uh, Three Waters reform, which, uh, uh, when I say mandate, to, to require Three Waters reform and aggregation into the forward entity model that's now uh, before Parliament, the region collaborated around a review of Three Waters delivery in the region that led to a conceptual model of a uh, a council-controlled organisation delivering three waters assets across uh, Hawke's Bay. That exercise was uh, participated in by uh, the regional council. We provided support to the territorial authorities on the basis that we had some interests, some of which you discussed earlier today in terms of the interface of our assets <coughs> with stormwater assets of the territorial authorities and also as the regulator of uh, drinking water, wastewater uh, and stormwater uh, we had interest in ensuring that the region was delivering three waters assets better. So we were involved in a collaboration. We were involved in the review. Uh, Petty was very much involved with leading the development of the cultural case. And at that point in time, I think there was, at least my perception was, there was a high level of support from uh, Tangata Whenua within the region for the Hawke's Bay model at that point. Subsequent to that, uh, central government announced their intention to come over the top create these new entities and, and uh, set aside the Hawke's Bay model as, as an option. Uh, the current consultation that's being undertaken uh, by the four territorial authorities has not involved us, so they are doing that, but historically we've been involved in a collaboration. So there are parts of the, the three waters, Hawke's Bay Three Waters website that uh, has, a, re has references to ourselves, uh, particularly in relation to the prior review but the current consultation uh, is very much territorial authorities and certainly this council has taken no position in relation to mm. the central government's uh, proposals that are now before Parliament. And to <clears throat> clear about this, I have been... Uh, uh, council have been cleared with council that we have, not, we've adopted, we have not adopted a, a position on three waters and certainly have not adopted a position to oppose three waters. We've not adopted a position to support three waters. We've said this isn't our, our argument. We worked collaboratively with the other councils to look at an alternative, but that's as far as we've gone. So uh, we've kind of sat on the fence for this. So. And I think okay. it's Yeah, to, just by association, your logo's there, so you, you, you think, oh, OK, no yep. support. But anyway, 
So, so, but, but, but in saying that, if the Hawke's Bay model showed co-governance, co-design with Tangata Whenua, then we would be supportive. But I don't ever remember us being supportive. If I'm going from the model that Morris and Lowe presented, it was the um, LTA and one Māori seat. And well, we don't support that. Well, I don't know that we get. I don't know that in the development of the Hawke's Bay model, we ever got to that level of granularity of it. And there was there was a there's a there's a there was a um, PowerPoint. I go, I distinctly remember that that and how much the rates were going to cost if we didn't go through this centralisation, especially for Waito. Um, our rates were up but in the four thousand. There was there was modelling. There was, was modelling. But anyway, the, yeah. the, the point is it's dead. Memorial Hall. Yeah. Yeah. The point is it's dead. It's going nowhere. Yeah. Okay, just, any, just, other there's always a mention of that any other questions on the Māori okay. Committee report? Up to the Chief. Uh, just a request, if I can, thanks. A follow-up action on 2.3 regarding the tuna deaths in the Te Whanganui Aoro 2. Yep. If someone could just circulate some comms around uh, to myself around what the follow-up was and sure. the consequences well, of that. that. Thank you, Secretary. Okay, will someone move the report? Charlie, Penny White. All those, in, any discussion? <laughs> well, you, look very, you look both very enthusiastic about it. I thought Controversial, it. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a long time. I mean, it's really you. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I, can see, I can see laterally. All right. I'll put the question. All those in favour will say aye. 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 Contrary, no. Any abstentions? None. Carried. We move to the report on the recommendations of the Regional Planning Committee. Uh, very ably chaired by Kias uh, Apiata from Tapani. So, would you like to comment on the RPC report? I'll take the report as read. Thank you, Mr. Chair. With the only comment I would say is that there were concerns expressed by both the Māori Standing Committee and the RPC around capacity. It has been addressed. We have work in play around how we might achieve those concerns, and so I'm um, looking forward to where that will land, um, particularly within the mana whenua space. The other thing I would note is that um, we have changes to members on a number of the Council's committees. With the appointment of Alana Hiha, our Deputy Co-Chair will be now representing on the Environment and Integrated Catchments Committee. Kerry Ropiha on the Corporate and Strategic Committee, Laura Kelly on the Hearings Committee with Mike Mohi. And so a part of that was, one, welcoming in some new members to the RPC, but also building a pathway of capacity and leadership, uh, trying to encourage particularly uh, Laura and Kelly, Kerry to um, invest long-term or short-term into a um, regional leadership role. And so looking forward to seeing where we can together build capacity in that space. Kia ora. I welcome that. It looks like a great uh, military manoeuvre. Spread out and advance. Chair, can I add uh, one point to the paper for clarification? Yes, sir. Pierre, and in the paper at uh, part four, in there it reads, the purpose of the policy, this is around the operational land asset policy, it says the purpose of the policy is to provide a framework for staff to use to assess applications and understand the technical aspects of the land to determine whether it is indeed surplus. So that's my apology to the RPC co-chair and to this forum. Uh, I missed that. It's not just about surplus, and if we were to read the operational land policy, we would understand that it goes far beyond that. Of course it does, yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, any questions? Councillor Williams. It's a, it's a question of procedure. There are three papers before us today that recommend we adopt the operational land policy, um, but there is no decision item before us to do that. Oh, yes, there is. There's an it's in, it's in the next the item. Corporate and strategic. Corporate and strategic. Well, that's just a recommendation. I, yeah, I haven't seen a resolution that we actually do it. If there is one, that's great. Let's yep. move it. But I haven't seen it. Okay. All right. Tennis. It's coming at you fast, Councillor Williams. <laughs> Give you first so, opportunity to move it. Oh, I see. I All think right. I, I support Martin's point, though, that it's important enough to almost be its own. But I know we, that went through committees. But well, we'll pull yeah. it out for its own separate resolution. Pull it out. Yeah, I think we need to, because I can't yeah. see a resolution. OK, I'll... Uh, uh, do I have a move and a second? I do, don't I? No, not yet, you haven't. Uh, the enthusiasm is waned tomorrow. Right. OK, right, well, uh, would you like to... I'll move the report. Up, would you like to second it? Am I able to second? I, I no, don't think I right can. <laughs> no. No. Well, you can't second the 
No. Will you pick I can't. No. Can't. can't move. Not the council. Yeah. Council curtain. Only you. Oh, those can. I'll second. 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 Right. Yep. No second. second. Whatever. One okay. of those two. Any any dis any any people like to speak to the report? Sorry. Being no speakers, I'll put the uh, question. All those in favour will say aye. Country right. no. Mm. Carried. Let's move to corporate and strategic report. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to ask yourself yeah, a question. Uh, yes, no. Um, you'd like me to? <laughs> Sorry. You'd like me to consider the? I like you to lead out the report. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, take the report as read, but. Uh, um, there are a number of um, important issues dis uh, considered at the committee, but the recommendations are on page 45. Um, and the first one of those is to receive and consider the report. Um, the important um, uh, recommendations for adoption are the annual plan, which um, is a very significant, obviously, a document for the year, but in response to Councillor. Williams, you'll see there at uh, item five, uh, recommendation five, um, sorry, six, the um, adoption of the operational land policy yep. uh, and the agreement to um, participate in the regional sector five. So, um, uh, are you, you happy to take, take questions, Councillor Curtin? Yes, I'm happy to take questions. Right, does anybody have questions of Councillor Curtin? Why are you so troubled? <laughs> <laughs> you are. That's good childhood. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, Mr. Chair, I, perhaps if we do take take uh, the recommendations in part, and I'll move uh, recommendations uh, one and two to get the ball rolling. All right. We've got a, do you have a second for that, Councillor Foss? One and two. Move those. Okay. Any discussion? Being none, I'll put the question. All those in favour of items one and two, please say aye. Aye. Uh, Entree no. Carried. Mr. Chair, I'll uh, move the adoption of um, uh, recommendations three, which is the annual plan, and recommendation four, which delegates to the Chief Financial Officer. Um, second. I'll second that for you. Help you here, Kurt. You, Mr. Chair, just a very Is brief it? comment um, and congratulations to staff on uh, a very, very significant and comprehensive document uh, once again. Um, I, don't, I do note the extensive coverage of Kotahi and the implications thereof in adopting that into the plan. Um, uh, and uh, I guess we just go with the flow. Um, we could change that to uh, Plan 24, but I think we'll just stick with Kotahi for the moment if that's, uh, and navigate the, the, uh, the mur mur murky waters that may follow from that. But uh, um, a comprehensive plan, and um, I think we've... Uh, covered our bases for 2022-23, for 20, 20, um, uh, a number of issues to face in terms of uh, the financials involved, uh, but uh, we will just, uh, uh, plans are plans, and I'm sure that uh, there'll be uh, many uh, variations on the way through, so we're uh, happy to move the plan. Uh, right. We'll move the I'll, recommendations I'll through. I'll go the right to speak as a seconder. Do any other speakers? I've got a point of order on this. Of order. You use the word recommendations, which is what is throwing me. Is the motion that we adopt the annual plan, or is the motion that the Corporate Strategic Committee recommends that we adopt the annual plan? I, I, I'm, I'm assuming it's the former, yes, and that there is a motion have, on the table it. to adopt. <laughs> the committee has already recommended. Yes. Uh, the question before you is whether you take the recommendation and adopt. I would have thought this was a decision item, not uh, something to It be... is a decision it's an item. It's got the first thing, it's got adopt. All right. Okay. In two places, annual plan, adoption, and item three is adopts the annual plan. Okay, we're clear it's being moved that we adopt the annual plan. Yes. Yeah. the motion on the table? Right. That's exactly Did. right. Okay. That was all order satisfied? Yeah. We're good on this side. All right. I'll put the question. All those in favour will say aye. Aye. Okay. With enthusiasm. Uh, contrary, no. The abstentions? Carried. Mr Chair, uh, recommendation five is that we agree to participate in the regional sector shared services council controlled organisation. I'll move that. I have a seconder. Councillor Ormsby. Would you like to speak? No. 
No, thank you. Okay. Any questions? Any audit issues here? No, I'm clear on the process now. I think it was okay. uh, All right. a little bit obscure <laughs> before, but now I'll put the question that we Has agreed to participate in regional shared services council controlled organisation. All those in favour will say aye. 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 Contrary, no. The abstentions. I declare it carried. Mr. Move to item six. Mr. Chair, um, uh, the recommendation six is that we adopt the operational land asset policy. There may be some questions. As proposed. All right, do I have a seconder? Councillor Ormsby. Would you like to speak, Councillor? No. Councillor Ormsby? Um, I think this is the fourth committee on a council after three committees, is that right? And a few workshops. <laughs> the fourth outing. This is our fourth outing. Um, and, and just to thank the staff for um, working it through with us um, and being able to have input into an operational policy. Um, that's another part. Um, but also just uh, very um, excited about what can come from uh, the policy um, and the, the building of relationships with mana whenua. Thank you. I'd like to speak and say that <clears throat> I support everything that Council Ormbusby said, uh, uh, whilst it's a pretty innocuous uh, title, uh, its significance and its import cannot be underestimated. There are a number of parcels of land that the Council has in its ambit, which it does not always fully utilise, uh, was taken by the force of law, and uh, uh, the Council now has a framework in which it can address that. There are other parcels of land which it has which are necessary for it, but this policy will enable it to reshape <coughs> a, a, a relationship with Manafen, with the original parties who owned the land, uh, to have import and manage it in a different way than what it is currently today. It's a way of readdressing uh, some of those issues of the past, uh, which operate in a different framework and different mindset. We are different today, as demonstrated by so many things, and this is, makes this country a better place. Uh, this council has a part to play in that changing public attitude, a part to play in changing how we relate, and this is simply a part of that as well. It's another step on the journey. So with that, I'll put the question. All those in favour say aye. 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 Contrary, no. Any abstentions? <coughs> Carry. Would you like to move yeah, uh, item 7 to 7.7? Uh, like to the seven? Um, seven, uh, uh, reports... Uh, um, uh, delivered at the Corporate Strategy Com Committee. Do I have a seconder? No Jack seconder. Yeah, got, uh, uh, Jack. Neil, yeah, Jack just on. a very brief comment, Mr Chair, and um, um, just to comment on the uh, People Plan, which is an exceptionally good document I've found, and uh, sets out uh, uh, a very good strategic position for us to be in there. And the second one is the Forestry Resource Plan, which I think, um, uh, sorry, the HBRC Forestry Report, uh, which um, I think will be a go-to document in years to come. So um, thank you for the staff for preparing those. Thank you. Councillor Taylor. No comments. Thank you. Any other speakers? Right, I'll put the question then. All those in favour will say aye. 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 But we know. Carried. I think we're getting the afternoon tea short. Mm -hmm. Energy levels are dropping. Do we want to do that now or after? Uh, Three thirty is the downfall. Let's uh, move along. Uh, uh, setting of the rates. This will fire you up with enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> I know you've all been waiting uh, uh, for this. And yeah, who's going to come along and address this? Right. Thank you. Uh, Ross here. Ross. Now, uh, Ross, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, that's what Chair. your assurance that you've checked all of these numbers to the uh, five decimal points. Correct. Uh, yep. And Mr. I. So this is very much a procedural uh, motion. This is setting the rates, which are also set out in the funding impact statement in the annual plan that you have just adopted. Yeah. Um, procedurally, you had to adopt the budget before we can set the rates, so it's, yeah. we've got it in the right order. Um, so this is under the legislation. Effectively, you go through, you know, set out blow by blow each rate and the rate in the dollar or per hectare, as per the rating policy. We have modelled to make sure we're going to get the correct amount of revenue. Um, 
and it's then being loaded in the rate system as we do to test it. So that once you adopt this, then Beth can go about and actually, obviously once she's done more maintenance after 30th of June, because you have to wait for updated valuations and subdivisions, etc., she can push the button and send out the rate notices. Thank you, Ross. Uh, any questions for Ross? Martin. Um, hello, Ross. Um, that's not thank, you, thank you. Thank you. I'm being polite. Okay, that's <laughs> may come as a surprise to you, but anyway, I'm giving it a go. Um, yeah. Paragraph <laughs> Ross. Paragraphs four and five. Can you just explain to me the difference between those two paragraphs, other than one that refers to section 51, 58.1a and one at 58.1b, and one's got a date of September 2022, and one's got a date of July 2022. What? Why do we have two uh, resolutions there? Uh, and what's the difference between them? Uh, I'm referring to resolutions for Yeah, yeah well, it confirms four that. Four and five. Yeah. What's, what's the difference between those two dates? What's, well, what's the difference between years. them in what, terms of what's happening, when and why? In three. So in I, three. I, I can answer that, Chair. So, so four relates to the 10% penalty that gets applied after uh, the due date of rates to be issued this year. Yep. Uh, five relates to the additional 10% penalty that comes on top of a previous 10% penalty, so the 20% penalty that applies to rates in the year just gone that are remain unpaid at the end of this financial year. And if I can point out, there's a little quirk in here. If you actually compare this to the... Um, you know, it sort of seems odd we're setting the rates and we're actually charging a penalty on the 1st of July, virtually first day of the year. The thing with the legislation is these these resolutions must relate to a financial year. So in the annual plan, as an example, in the funding impact statement, <coughs> we're actually sort of saying in a natural flow, we're going to set a penalty if you're unpaid during the year, and then we're going to add another penalty in July 23. But procedurally, in terms of this resolution, it must be we're setting that penalty for people who haven't paid by 30th of June, which is tomorrow. Then we're actually saying, well, you, you incur an additional penalty. And we, that's the last this, year's rates. That's the last year's rates. Last year's rates. And, and that is that is Just happens because the, the dates policy. in the resolution must be yeah. within a financial year. But you're adding the words in by implication. The penalty will be applied to all pay, unpaid rates from 2021 as at 1 July 2022, right? Well, it's in, and 21 and because there will be arrears from previous years as well. Yeah, from, okay. Yeah. Yep. Council, if I could just, just remind you that we do have a remissions policy uh, and we do uh, uh, take every step to assist ratepayers who are uh, having difficulty meeting their um, payment obligations by way of coming up with a, a payment plan. So uh, while there are penalties uh, that apply and uh, a total of a 20% penalty for an unpaid uh, rates uh, notice at the end of the year uh, may seem high. Um, there are certainly a good number of ratepayers who are assisted <coughs> by way of working with our rate staff to ensure that ultimately the, the rates are paid and collected. Okay. Any other questions? Sorry, Chair. Sure. Yep. Wait, no, stop apologies. Oh, we're looking for good questions. Um, it might be very minor, Ross, and sorry I'd take you on this rodeo again because I think we did it last annual plan. Yeah. Um, just with the classifications um, around rates set on, if we go to 2.3.5. 2.3.5. It's got animal pest strategy based on land, uh, on area and land use. So if you look at the table... When we go to those activities, do we need to add on the end land use to the rate set on? So it has the area basis. No, that I guess the land use defines the differential category. For example, land use one la a land use is forestry, which is a different rate per area than plant pest. That's more defines links to the the fact that they're set differentially. Okay, so, so that's a no. We don't, we don't, don't need, need to the land use on you. Resolution. Okay. Well, that's good. Right. 
That's a sharp question. Have any more sharp questions? <laughs> Look, I, I can answer that. I don't think so, because uh, I think it's implicit in the, the statement of forestry, but you, you're quite right, it could be clearer that that, other, that is based on... I suppose the other point is a clear linkage. There's, more, there's a greater description on how we rate in the funding impact statement in the annual plan, and that's, and that's part of it. You know, it's as per the funding impact statement. Part of the resolution is you're setting these as per the funding impact statement, so the funding impact statement explains a bit more of the basis of rating for each of the rates. Oh. Okay, as, as long as it's covered. Okay. Okay. I hope so. Yeah. You, you well, hope so? You. Or... <laughs> check, double check. Your, your annual bonus depends on this. <laughs> Is that the annual plan? <laughs> okay, any other questions? All right, would someone like to move uh, our recommendations one to five? <coughs> Councillor Curtin. Councillor Foss. Would you like to speak, Councillor Curtin? Councillor Foss. Would you like to speak? Uh, thank you, Chair. No, uh, thank you for your, your team uh, work. But on behalf of ratepayers, obviously, we'll be holding every cent to account wherever we can and look into you to assist us for that accountability and efficiency. <laughs> wow. Any other Top of the comments? Tree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A stage right. point in light of the next item on the agenda. <laughs> I'll put the, uh, uh, <laughs> put the question. All those in favour will say aye. 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 Contrary, no. Abstentions? Carried. Putting aside all private and personal interest, we do now move to item 13. <laughs> this should take two minutes. That's slow. Fair uh, No, it's fast, actually. Yeah. No, it's not, actually. No, it's not. Oh. 3.34. 3.34. Yeah. Oh, just slightly. Quite right. I'm fast. Uh, um, Chief Executive, would you like to speak briefly to this? Again, it's a report that's uh, self-explanatory, and there's not much we can do either way about it. Uh, look, it, look, it is all determined um, independently of Council by the Remuneration Authority, uh, and so uh, yeah, you and Council officers have... Uh, no discretion in this matter. It is all determined by a matter of uh, regulation, uh, and but you are required to um, uh, adopt uh, what is recommended or what is, yeah, what is required of you. Uh, so it's set out as recommendations. Um, uh, there are obviously um, some extra matters in there which have been consulted on in recent times, and particularly in terms of expenses, and there is um, some description of those. So. We can do our best to answer any questions you may have. Otherwise, um, it simply needs adoption so that you can be duly remunerated. Questions? Up here. Nice and simple question. Uh, number 14, considerations for Tangata Whenua. It gives options there around um, consideration uh, by council, and there's a trigger there that council can uh, also initiate a review. Um, is there a schedule that can be circulated so that we can engage in conversation prior to no schedule, no. How, how are we pre-informing our tangata whenua members so that they can actively participate in any court at all that you may wish to have? So I think we, uh, we can provide you with information about the current uh, uh, remuneration arrangements of both the Māori Committee and the Regional Planning Committee, uh, and perhaps take a conversation with the uh, Te Pau Whakarai off offline leading into the next triennium so that we start next uh, triennium when committee structures and terms of references are adopted uh, with the remuneration as part of the package of consideration at that time. That sounds like a welcome suggestion. We're just looking for a date, really, so that we know we can lock it in. Post-election. Post-election. Thank you. OK, any other questions? A bit of move. Councillor Foley, seconder. Councillor Taylor. Would you like to speak? Action. Action. Any other speakers? Any speakers, right? I'll put the question. All those in favour will say aye. Adopting recommendations one and two. Contrary, no. Abstentions? Carried. Um, on behalf of uh, Europe, I'll move uh, affixing Coleman's seal. Seconder, yeah. Will, any questions, debate? I'll put the question. All those in favour will say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. Extensions, carried. 
people to leave the, for a break now for a cup of coffee. Is coffee said. available? <laughs> 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 right, we'll now we'll go through the decision items. You think about uh, what's the plan? Right, sir? What's what? We've taken the bumper. Coffee. Oh, oh come on. Yeah. <laughs>
Do I have a seconder? Charlie, Councillor Lambert. Any questions? Any <coughs> comments? Any statements? Speeches? There being none, I'll put the question. All those in favour will say aye. <coughs> Country no carried. Uh, uh, report from the Regional Transport Committee. Would you like to make some introductory comments about this, Martin? We've all read the paper. Yes, yeah, thank you. Look, um, there's, a, there's just a heck of a lot going on in, in the transport uh, space at the moment. And I guess, I guess my first comment would be to acknowledge the enormous burden that um, Katie Nimmin um, has been shouldering uh, over recent months, if not since she got here, uh, in particular to get my way uh, off the off the ground and successfully launched. Um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, a, a truly heroic effort and a huge amount of innovation and resolve to, to overcome roadblocks that many people might have just said, well, that's it, it's not going to happen. It has happened, and from day one, it hit 100% of the uh, highest level of the three bus routes that it replaced, and then the next day, it was 20% more, and the next day, it was 20% more. Um, cool. There have been... <laughs> Understandably, some hiccups and some learnings, uh, and I just commend the team for the way that they've responded to all of that, uh, and to Katrina for her support for Katie through all of that process, because it's been a, a real team effort, um, and equally our engagement team, uh, who have really got to the the, the, um, the edges of the community uh, that is served by the current route, and that would have been challenged by the transition. So, um, big ups to them. Um, and I think that bodes well for the future. So that, that, that's that. Um, the Regional Land Transport Plan, I believe, will be coming to a workshop in July before being adopted uh, or put to this committee for adoption uh, in um, the, 20, the next the July meeting, which I think is 29 July or 27 July. This is another one of those processes where we're actually going to have to consult on something before we consult on funding it. It's out of step, it's a bit like possums. Um, it is a dramatic, uh, in terms of what has been recommended by the committee for, uh, in terms of the resolutions down there, there was a recommendation from the committee that we do adopt it on 27 July. It is, it is a step change in the level of public transport sitting around uh, you know, the future rollout of my way into nature and what have you. It does involve a doubling and a trebling of the frequency of court routes uh, and really focusing on, uh, I guess, patronage over coverage. In other words, having routes that are lit more linear and more regular than trying to cover everywhere and being therefore very clunky and slow and not particularly attractive. So it's about getting uh, bangs for the buck, I guess, for the investment. And so both Hastings and uh, Napier will get on their main trunk routes a considerably higher level of service, a higher frequency, and therefore reliability, and it's more attractive for people to use. It's, it does include a, uh, a, a service for the first time from uh, uh, Waipokoro. So that, that's really exciting. That's coming your way, but it comes at a $12 million price tag. And the long-term plan at the moment ratchets between $7 million and $10 million. So there is going to need to be a conversation with the community uh, about that, um, firstly as to the plan, secondly as to the funding model, uh, but with the sort of understanding of what's, what's ahead. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot going on in terms of uh, interactions with uh, other regions um, and uh, around active transport. That's uh, something that I know Councillor Van Bake has been very passionate about and there is a discussion going on at the moment about what's the, the best way, if I could put it, to positively discriminate in favour of uh, active transport in all future uh, investment decisions regarding um, transportation infrastructure. And uh, there are different schools of thought about that at the moment that we are working our way through uh, between the uh, option recommended for a regional active transport committee, um, which has come to us from the, the cycling interest, uh, and uh, the, uh, something closer to the current model. Uh, but with a, a broader base of advice to the Regional Transport Committee. So watch that space. Um, but, uh, yeah, and then there's the Gisborne Rail that you're aware of, the report that's gone to Cabinet, or, or Government, I should say, uh, for a business case uh, to look at reopening the Gisborne Railway line, and that's really uh, in the hands of Central Government at the moment. Um, 
yeah, State Highway 5 is uh, still live um, and watch this space as well. So um, that's what I can say on, the, on that point at the moment. It's uh, a very exciting time to be in, in transport and I think in the context of the Emissions Reduction Plan, the climate change objectives and strategic objectives of this council, um, you know, this is uh, a very interesting time indeed. Okay, any questions? You're happy to take questions? Yes. Um, um, uh, sure. Sorry, Martin, what, what does 2.3 mean? Services for Wattle Township are being proposed using a volunteer community funding model. Yes, so that's a, that's a great question. So what we're looking at there at the moment, Wairua, which has got the lowest rates of car ownership, has got the <laughs> zero public transport. Um, and so on an equity basis, which is alongside climate change, public transport is all about. We're looking at how can we um, get something going within the life of this public transport plan. And the recommendation from MR Cagney is that we partner with um, community agencies and resource those community agencies to provide a form of public transport service using existing infrastructure. When I say infrastructure, I mean mini buses. Yeah. Uh, there could be um, schools, PSGs, uh, community groups, rural delivery, whoever it might be, that we can actually, you know, using the technology, um, resource and coordinate so that it forms a sort of a, from the, you know, the grassroots up community driven public transport service. So that's what that's about. Okay. Thank you. How, it, how would that impact on uh, active transport? You said you would want to promote active transport. Presumably they have a very high level of active transport. So well, it's to diminish the active transport capacity with the viral. No yeah, well, it's, it's, it's kind of a forced, <laughs> act, forced act of transport, I would have thought. Um, and for those that can't be active, then that's, that's not great. So, look, it's everything. If you're looking at transport, you've got to look holistically. It's urban design. If, if, if you've got fences to the road that the buses come on, you've got to go and walk around three blocks to get the bus go. You know, the way you've designed your subdivisions is wrong. It's um, in, in making sure that active transport and public transport work together. Can you put your bike on the bus? Uh, where's the nearest cycleway in relation to the bus stop or the walkways? Is, are they safe? Um, yeah, so, and then are you incentivising uh, free parking in town? Uh, when if mm. you could ride on a my way uh, for $2 anywhere in Hastings, you don't need to park in town. It's actually making sure the whole system works. So active transport and public transport are very closely it's interrelated close. and it's sinking across. So it's a good question, uh, but if it's active transport and wider at the it's moment, I'd say that's, for some right people, way. forced um, rather than planned. All right. Any other questions? Would you like to move your report be received? Yeah, I'll, I'll move. I'll move your report. The recommendations uh, one to one point six. I do indeed. I so move. All right. Do I have a second of it? Councillor Foss. All right. Would you like to speak? I think I have. Yeah. <coughs> the other speakers. Put the question. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. Abstentions. Carried. We now move on to the next one. Reports from councillors meeting outside bodies. Councillor Foley. Oh, just a quick update from Future Farming <coughs> Trust. Um, pleased to announce that Hastings District Council have become a significant sponsor to the Trust, and so we welcome their contribution and support for, um, um, obviously, um, the many and varied uh, primary production um, um, businesses across Hiratonga. So, um, yeah, so that's a... Welcome addition to the to the sponsorship family that's growing with Future Farming Trust. Very good. Any other reports? <coughs> Being done, I'll move on to uh, the items for not on the agenda for discuss minor items. Sorry? Minor items. Minor items, yeah. I was trying to read my writing here. I've got one about environment. Is that uh, Environment Centre, who was that? That was the year. That was oh. That's right, I've got to put down the centre. Yeah, look, just um, I read with uh, some concern the um, article in yesterday's Hawke's Bay today that the Environment Centre was no longer uh, able to enjoy the free leasehold tenure that it had been provided for um, in, in Hastings with a redevelopment of that building being proposed and that they are looking for um, 
other uh, accommodation options or premises options. They provide a vital service, I think, of relevance to this council in terms of you know, it's the only place you can go to sustainably dispose of. You know, we all know that we've got 500 um, charges and old batteries and goodness knows what around the house, and unless they get chucked in the landfill, that's basically the only place that they can go to at the moment. Um, and they are looking for funding because their budget is going to increase, I think, if I can just, um, quite quite considerably uh, as a result of now having to, to pay rent. Uh, and I, I think they are looking for uh, funding um, support to be able to continue to operate. Um, and, you know, I'm just wondering, I guess, asking the question. They're trying to raise $250,000 to operate over the next year, $100,000 for a building lease and outgoings and 150000 for three new employees to provide recycling and climate change action. Is there anything that this council could do uh, in that context, bearing in mind you know, our um, view, our strategic aims and objectives uh, to help with that process? I'm just putting it on the table for um, staff to think about. Um, yeah, that, that's my minor item. So I think they're a very you, valuable Chair, service. Can I just... Uh, quickly respond to say that I have had a meeting with the uh, the general manager of the uh, Environment Centre in the last week, quantified that their budget shortfall is in the order of $160,000 a year uh, starting the 1st of July. Uh, she has sent the strategic plan for the organisation, which I'll circulate to councillors for your information. Uh, the <coughs> difficulty that uh, we have, I guess, is that uh, we're outside of our budgeting cycle, uh, yes. We've just adopted, obviously, an annual plan, and we couldn't yes. have made a, a variation of that annual plan easily, uh, and we uh, will obviously lead into the next long-term plan and the next triennium, which would be an opportunity to consider uh, funding uh, of that nature. Um, we, we have at the margin some flexibility probably around some of our funds that might be applicable here, so I was going to have a look at that, but I, I'm... I'm hesitant to uh, raise any expectations that just given yes. the decisions that council's already made about council activity and uh, and the pressures on uh, council priorities that, that we can do this. Um, but certainly uh, there is a di existing dialogue between um, uh, council staff, including our climate action <coughs> ambassador, the environment centre around particular projects and things that we can do together uh, where there's um, mutual interest so it might be that it's more in-kind and collaborative uh, support uh, in the short term, and then more longer term, uh, Council could consider what it wishes mm. to make. Uh, enter into what I would recommend to be a sort of a more of a long-term and sustainable funding commitment uh, if Council was of a mind to go there. Thank you. Thank you, James. I'm aware we've already looked down the back of the couch for just a bit of everything we're going to imagine. So <coughs> and I'm aware that these are uh, uh, non-debatable items. Yes. Yes, it was yeah. people wanting to get out of here. So let's move on to the next one. Balance Farm Awards. Oh, thanks, Chair. Um, look, many of you were there last night. It was great to see Hawkesbury Regional Council so well represented, um, council and staff, um, at the awards last night. Just a, a quick mention to the overall winners, Mark and Jane Johnson, from LQ Station up in the Gisborne District. So well done to them. Just to note, the new award um, that was presented last night, the Catchment Award, which, um, as we know, there's lots of catchment groups um, up and running or, or lots starting, and there's some great work going on. And so this award was um, this great timing, really, to start to recognise some of that great work that's going on. And well done to Tukapo Catchment um, Care Group from Mercy Clinton Tamatea, um, to recognise their, I guess, early adoption, um, some of the great work. We know the, the wetland down there in partnership with Fonterra and others, that's underway. And, um, yeah, just the the um, kilometres of fencing and plants that they've got in so far, that, you know, they're well-deserved winners, so it was great to see them recognised. Um, and I'm sure there'll be plenty more great catchment groups to come in over the years to be recognised. Um, for all the good work that is going on out there. So, yeah, just thought I'd mention that. Thank you. Heavy, heavy stream. Thanks, thanks, Chair. I bring good news. The heavy, heavy stream uh, originates from a spring in the southern end of Tamata Peak. 
uh, goes down and joins the Katamu uh, stream just this side of the new James Waddy Retirement Village, um, just south of Havelock North there. Uh, we recently had a planting day, a community planting day. Can I absolutely thank, fully acknowledge um, the staff, the residents um, and the corporate structure over top of the James Waddy Retirement Village. Um, my colleagues, Jeriff, Jacqueline Taylor and Hinoi Ormsby, um, between us we helped pull uh, day, this day together. 65 Year 8 boys from Heroworth <coughs> School um, and the team at the, uh, the Hawke's Bay Regional Council prep team, uh, Open Spaces team, I'm not sure which part they are, all gave an invaluable contribution. Uh, the Ormsby um, Fano um, very, very generously donated 1,000 plants um, for us to put in and cherish. Um, and Councillor Ormsby's um, uh, educational teacher type tendencies came through loud and clear as she showed us what to do. <laughs> um, but it was a very, very uh, special day. Um, colleagues, that stream has been neglected, it's been let go, it's been abandoned. Um, many organisations and individuals, including this one, in my opinion, and Hastings District Council, have just turned their back on it for various reasons. doesn't really matter why. Um, what matters is we've done something about it. So a thousand trees have now been planted there. Um, we're no longer, no one's going to turn their back on it. It looks stunning. Um, and now we're already looking forward to the next one. We've got a new corporate model potentially coming on board where the James Waddy Retirement Village may well take on or at least contribute to the maintenance of that planting in the tracks and help seed some of the funding for those new public assets in and around that area um, to join up with some inf existing infrastructure. So that's really fantastic. There's many planting days go on all the time, uh, chair, and they are just... Absolutely fantastic. I think a few of us are tuning up to another Boss Talks one on Saturday morning um, on the Karabu. So uh, thank you. That's God's work. And uh, every single one of those plants makes a difference. So I very, very much appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> that comes Chair, to... Excuse me, Chair. I wondered if I could put in a late mine item. <laughs> Another very brief short. of the standing orders, but I'll give it away because you I knew that might be the case, but I'll be very quick. Sure. As... You know I'm very passionate about plain language and once again will be a judge for this year's plain language awards. There are many categories, so I won't necessarily be a judge for the Chief Executive or Hawke's Bay Regional Council's entry. I will make sure I'm not. So I, I am just pushing you along CE to see if you might put an entry into the plain language awards this year. The entries close on the 31st of July. You've got some nice consultation documents that we've seen today that you might like to consider, or perhaps the communications team may have something else up their sleeves that they'd like to submit. Uh, it's a great opportunity for learning a bit about and getting feedback on your communication with our region, our ratepayers, um, and potentially you might be doing a pretty good job and could win. But anyway, it's an option, and I would like Hawke's Bay Regional Council to consider it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> On plain language, I thought the most instructive thing I've ever read about language is by Robespierre, <clears throat> who was the chief executioner in the French Revolution, who once said, let any person write three words and I'll have enough to guillotine them. <laughs> <laughs> New policy, perhaps. Pierre, would you like to close us up before I bend it? <laughs> Good appeal to a higher creative <laughs> Thank you, councillors. That's been a very heavy day from nine o'clock onwards, and when you look back on the agenda, you'll see some pretty substantive items covered and some substantial work. So you can tick off the month and say, we did a good job this month. We'll do the same next month. So have a good weekend.